to his family. Now, Mr. President, Minister Robinson is a special person in a lot of sense because I was introduced to Mr. Robinson by former Prime Minister Siaga. Interestingly, whilst on the campaign trail in Northeast St. in 2001, because myself and Donald Buchanan were assigned in a community uh, Senator Skeffrey called Paritone. And so I was there traversing all of those places, Pimenta Walk, all over. And on the beat, I came across uh, Mr. Siaga mm -hmm. and uh, Ms. Robinson, and we had an introduction and pleasantries exchanged. And from then, I had a very good relationship with uh, Ms. Robinson uh, when she became Minister of Labor and Social Security. She asked me if I was willing to serve on the board, the National Advisory Board, because I had been serving there previously. And she asked me, and I told her I had no problem. And I was um, reappointed to serve on the board. And I pledged to her that I would work to make sure that the Disabilities Act that we passed in 2014 be realized. And in different ways, I was working with her to make sure that the legislation be brought to fruition. The law requires that um, the appointed day be set by the minister, but in order to have the effective day of the legislation uh, set, a number of things had to be done, including the drafting of codes of practice to help prevent discrimination against persons with disabilities. And because of my commitment to ensuring that this was realized, I, you know, the government had advertised for uh, the, a consultant to complete and draft and complete the codes of practice for persons with disabilities, employment, and I was successful in the bid. But I said to her, Minister, you won't have to extend this contract because I'm going to finish it in time for you to set the effective date because I am working with you on the realization of that particular objective. And it was completed in time and submitted uh, to her. But there were other codes of practice that had to be put in place as well. And that has held up the process. But I know that she was extremely committed to realizing that objective of getting the, uh, uh, the, the, the appointed day set for the legislation. As a matter of fact, I remember a consultation that we had at the Jamaica Pegasus. And I was telling her, I said to her, Minister, set the effective date, set the appointed date, and I will be out there front and center in defending you where that is concerned. And I made sure I made the statement before everybody because I was very much committed to, to it. But the, the, there were certain exigencies, there were certain issues that she had to weigh. 
as a minister and I understand very well the challenges that she had to grapple with but you know I, I, I am deeply saddened I'm deeply disheartened by her passing and I just want to say to members of this honorable Senate, we are in a profession where we are categorized as politicians. And it is a profession that we come under a lot of pressure, a lot of criticism, a lot of stress. And I'm not saying that we are beyond criticism. But I'm imploring us to one, make sure that we respect and live a life with each other that we can really count on each other for support from time to time. It is a lonely journey and we all need, uh, need each other in difficult moments like this. And I want to also say, um, uh, Mr. President, that it is extremely important that in this life we build a strong relationship with our Creator. And from all intents and purposes, I understand that both Mrs. Robinson and Dr. Gallimore had established a saving relationship with their creator. As a matter of fact, Mr. President, the mantra for Dr. Gallimore was nation, God first, nation second, party, sec uh, party third. And so it demonstrates his uh, commitment to his God. And I want to implore all of us, no matter how big and powerful we might seem to be in our profession and in the society, always remember that there is a creator. Always remember that it is important for us to build that sort of relationship. And one of the best ways in which we can celebrate the life of Dr. Gallimore and Mrs. Robinson is by making sure that we develop that close, close relationship with our Creator and King. They have made the transition. They have fought the fight and they have finished their course and they have made the transition. May their souls rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Morris. You know, just, just to indicate, you, you can go ahead, Senator Gaylord, I'm just telling you that. Every time I went into St. Anne and went through the toll, as I pay the toll, I will get a telephone call from Shaini. Tom, what are you doing in my constituency? <laughs> so I, <laughs> I think there might have been a few of our constituents working at the toll, and they were told to give her an update. It never failed, you know. What are you doing down here? <laughs> and the other thing I point out to the minister was talking about Gallimore. Um, Gallimore played a crucial role in the transition during the Haitian crisis. I think he was at the ministry at that time. And his um, persuasive skills were used, I think, to intervene with um, Bebe, young um, Duvalle, and Michel Duvalle. 
Mr. President, this morning I rise to pay my respect to two outstanding, in my mind, servants of the people. Dr. Neville Gallimore, I never interfaced with him whilst he was minister of government in any way. But I would have interacted with him as a party man, and that he was, a committed, loyal party man. Every political meeting that you would have had, whether it be at Belmont Road or anywhere, Dr. Gallimore would have been present. <laughs> and he, was a, he would have been present and upfront in the midst of things, because that's the type of commitment that he demonstrated and displayed. And uh, one of the things, when I, every time I meet him, or I would have had the opportunity to come in contact with him, he would ask me, how is Bustamante's union? Are you keeping the union intact? Is the membership okay? That's the type of person he was. He would, he would come into a room and he would interact with everybody in that room. He was a friendly type of individual. And so I pay my respects to him. I extend condolences to his family. And may his soul rest in peace. On the point, Mr. President, of... Shaini Robinson. Now, you will meet some persons in life and they demonstrate traits or characteristics of another person. And you will say that that person is like that person. Make no mistake, there was no two Shaini Robinson. She was a unique person in her own right. And I would have interfaced with her at the Ministry of Labor, mostly. And in my mind, I consider Shaini to be one of the most friendliest ministers of labor. One of the most friendliest ministers of labor. In terms of her personality, in terms of how she would have interacted in the midst of a dispute, how she would relate to the employer and how she would relate to the workers and how she would relate to the trade unions. Mr. President, one of the things I appreciated about her is that most of the time she speaks, she speaks promoting the well-being and the safety and health of the workers. And it is no doubt in my mind that is why today we are dealing with, in the parliament, the occupational safety and health legislation. I commend her for bringing that piece of legislation that has been languishing for decades to the nation's parliament. The other thing I want to commend her on is that for years we would have spoken about having a division of the Industrial Disputes Tribunal in the West. And everybody, every minister spoke about it and spoke about its intent and its promise. Shaheeni Robinson made that a reality. She decided that workers in the West no, don't have no need to come to Kingston because Kingston alone was not Jamaica. One of the other things is that, you know, she promoted knowing what she did as a political representative in winning that seat in St. Anne. 
I believe it became her nature to promote the rights of women. And by doing so, if you look at the structure and the divisions of the tribunal now, the chairman of Western Division of the Tribunal is a woman. The chairman of the Industrial Disputes Tribunal is a woman. There are more women representing the panels of the tribunal in history. And we owe that to Shahini Robbins. <laughs> Mr. President, she had a way of directing issues and disputes at the ministry. And I remember having a dispute there that we had to get the minister involved. And there was no way that I thought that we could have resolved that dispute. As a matter of fact, I, I was putting it in my frame of mind that this issue is destined for the Industrial Disputes Tribunal. So we broke into unilateral discussions and one of the ministry officials came to me and said to me, there's a call from your office. And, you know, I looked at my cell phone. I, I said, nobody was trying to call me. So I came out of the, and I knew what this meant. So I came out of the, the, the meeting room, and it so happened that the call was coming from the office of the minister. So when I went into the, her office, and she had a way, Mr. President, of not pronouncing my name correctly, like some people I know. <laughs> and she, she said to me, when I, <laughs> when I went into her office, she said to me, and she was akimbo, and she said to me, Kevin, when I left her today without a second this, you know. <laughs> and so, that was the instruction. We're not leaving until we settle this. One of the things I appreciated about her is that, you know, she knows everybody. And you don't know that she know you, but she know you. And I would have reasons to, there was a hotel that I represent. And I visited the property, and she was on the property. And so we were walking up and down the property. And everybody she knew. And she called out to them, and she greeted them. And you would know that sometimes she didn't even know them by the way she greeted them. And she greeted this man that was a, you know, one of those troublemakers on property. And she said, Humphrey, where are you? Are you doing your you work? Make sure you do the people I'm working on. And I said to her after that, and they spoke like they knew each other. And I said to her after that, Minister, where you know Humphrey from? I don't know Humphrey, but him have him name tag. <laughs> Mr. President, I had reasons again to, there was an industrial action at a particular, that same hotel. And, you know, Senator Brown, sometimes you have an industrial action and you want the action to simmer a little. So I wasn't answering my phone. Not available. I wasn't answering my phone. And here is the phone ringing, Minister Shaheeni Robinson calling. Yes, but there are some other things that you're not going to learn because it won't be said. Minister Shahini Robinson calling. I said, yes, Minister. Good morning, Minister. She said, Kevin, you have the people I'm running up on strike. I said, where are you, Minister? I am down here with the people. What time you coming? I said, Minister, give me about two hours. She said, no, man, we just opened up highway. You have one hour to get here. And so when I went down there, she was in the midst of the crowd with the people. 
And I had to ask our minister, are you participating in this industrial action? She said, no, I come here to make sure you get the people back to work. Because she, be also, she believed in productivity. She believed in ensuring that if a dispute is there, that dispute must be resolved. And I recall, Mr. President, Senator Brown, you know of the history of representation in the bauxite industry. And you know that that would have been in terms of representing trade unions, representing the bauxite industry, it's open warfare in the history. And I recall us. Figuratively, though. Um, if I was to recount the history, sir, it wouldn't be figuratively. <laughs> Yes. But I recall three unions attempt to represent the workers at Gisco Alpart. And it became open warfare, mudslinging amongst the unions. And for some reason, the minister, what she did was to call all parties together, including the employers, and suggested that we are not going to have any breakdown in these operations or production. What we are going to do is exercise the rights under the LRIDA to treat with the question of representation without having a representational rights poll. And so, I give credit to Minister Robinson for bringing all parties together in ensuring that the workers at Gisco Park is represented by trade unions without having a representational rights poll. What she did was to exercise the flexibility of what is contained in the law to ensure that parties can come together and work it out. And that was one of her strengths, Mr. President. And well, when you see how she operates at the Labour Advisory Committee meetings, in chairing those meetings, in bringing both employer and the trade unions together, and sometimes, you know, Mr. President, trade unions have become trusting of employers. And we have come a far way when we can trust the state but to have the tripartite together on the one accord promoting labor reform and coming to understanding she had a gift of bringing the parties together and we can agree without quarreling. When you see Senator Lambert Brown coming into a labor advisory committee meeting and leaving smiling, you can understand and appreciate. Mr. Mr. President. She was, Shahini Robinson was good for the workers. She was good for the trade union movement. She was good for the employers. She was good for the state. And she was excellent for Jamaica. It's a pity in life that some people have to go so soon. I extend toast to Shahini Robinson. I extend condolences to all the people that she has served, including the members of her constituency who she knew so well. And I hope that notwithstanding the fact that there are no two Shahini Robinson, there may be another one on the horizon later on. May her soul rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Gill. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sure this is going to be a very short tribute on my part because so much has been said already that I wanted to say. So let me start like everybody else, Mr. President with Dr. 
never gather more. I've been around the politics long enough to have known him. He was the one who was very public and been confronting issues. Do I just walked into the library and was trying to look to see the official title that he had beyond the Foreign Affairs Ministry of State. And I saw a conversation where he was taking on the chairman of a committee meeting. And he was making it clear about freedom of speech. When they told him that he, has, he had enough freedom, he made it clear to them that he had a 30,000 strong in Southwest St. Anne and he couldn't be wrong. So he had a sense of humor as well. It was a couple of weeks ago that Peter Bunting shared with some of us in a WhatsApp group. In fact, it was the Shadow Cabinet WhatsApp group. The fact that he had run into Dr. Gallimore in Mandeville and Dr. Gallimore conveyed to him that the doctor has given him two months to live. And that note from MP Bunting made the point that there was a degree of confidence that he couldn't understand with Dr. Gallimore while he was conveying to him the fact that it was just two more months I have here. I'm going off to the States now for palliative treatment because it was over. And it was just no case of pain management and so forth. So we were alerted that he was considering his transition from this earth. And it dawned on me that that conversation with Peter reflected a man of faith and St. Mars would have hit the nail on the head. He was a man of deep faith. For all I've known him, he has been associated with that Adventist church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. So his faith is strong, and I have no doubt it took him to the period. Strange, Mr. President, that one of the lasting impression I have had of him was a telephone call he made in the 1980s. At that time, the Jamaica Food Stamp Program was being implemented. A colleague of mine from the left, Dan Robottom, was a frequent caller to talk shows. And Dan had called in and lambasted the Food Stamp Program. At that time, it was about $4 a week or a fortnight. That was the food stamp grant. So clearly that was a paltry sum. The crash program check was 27. I don't think the food stamp. No, it was about that. I just, don't, don't go to crash program. Don't go to the crash program. But what it might tell you how little the money was. That, that's what it did. It tell you how little. But because at that time it was catering for people who had, was earning less than $2,300 per annum. So the money was small then. But the point is not to detract from what, doctor, what I want to talk about. is scathing comments were made about what the food stamp could do. And Dr. Gallimore called in to the radio station. Can't recall who was the host. But I recall the call. And he made the point without any personal attack or any ideological attack. He simply said that those academics from the university can complain about a little four dollar, whatever the figure was. 
But to them, it may be small. But to the lactating mother, to the single mother out there, that was a whole leap in terms of meeting some of her needs. And that reflect Neville Gallimore. He was a people's person. He understood that even if you did a little for them, you were doing a lot. And so it stuck with me, Senator Hill, that there are two views. Your view which says it's not enough, but the recipient view who says it's a good move and I respect it. And that was the power of that little call from Dr. Gallimore that has stuck with me from the 1980s into now. And I respect him. I respect, as Senator, Senator Morris said, the service of his family. About not Gallimore, with the history, Mr. President, of changing his name to have a double A so that he'll be top of the ballot. Yes, he did, the father did. And never came and served, and young Anjo never son served as well. And it's a service to the country. We thank the Gallimore family for their service. We thank never Gall Dr. Gallimore for his service to the country. May his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on him. In respect to Minister Shine Robinson. I just want to say she was a woman of courage. She was a woman of courage. To follow Mr. Saga's advice and to run in a strong PNP seat took courage. And I respect her for that courage. I was down there at the by-election and I could tell you from morning to evening the PNP was losing. A JLP juggernaut that we only saw in the 1980 was at work. She became MP and she has served in the parliament ever since that time in 2001. I speak of her courage, Mr. President, because even in her illness, if you didn't know as some of us did, that she was ill. Sitting where Senator Morrison is now, you'd never know that she was in pain and she was suffering. When, during the COVID, she took out that video to appeal to employers and workers to work together, that took a lot of courage. Took a lot of courage. If you look behind the makeup, you could see that she was in physical pain. But she felt she needed to be there for the people of the country and the workers. And I respect her as a woman of courage. I don't need to go to present the things she has done in the Ministry of Labor, because essentially she ran her part of the relay, and I will say she ran it effectively. Portia Simsimila, first female Minister of Labor, she follows on a number of Ministers of Labor. But what I found about her in her role as Minister, Minister of Labor is that her humility allowed her to surround herself with advisors who knew the system. And that helped her. It helped her because whether it is the ILO, whether it is the conciliation, she had people around her who knew the system and whose advice she took freely. And I think that was very, very helpful to her. She was also willing to delegate. It's not just her illness, I believe. But she delegated to Junior Minister Xavier Main the task of taking the Occupation Safety and Health Bill to the Parliament. She knew how to maneuver amongst the unionists. 
she would simply say, Lammy is my friend. And then that's disarming. Don't try it. But try in the code, right? <laughs> try in the code. Lammy is my friend. And things flow. That is why I could smile after the LAC meeting because we spoke as friends. But she delegated that task to Xavier Mean who I must confess has done a wonderful job in steering the committee. And I hope the bill will be ready soon so that we can debate it here and pass it. So, our ability and willingness to delegate. Senator Gill, her outreach, she took the Ministry of Labor, not just into Western Division, but she took it in an outreach, she got her conciliation officers and her other officers to go out into the communities. And that, I think, was very, very positive. It happened that the morning she died, we were on an LAC call. No, it's the morning before that. We were on an LAC call in which we were all wishing her well. So, President, outside of the ministry, I was delegated to do a task at a funeral in St. Mary. Big funeral. St. Mary, not St. Anne. And all of a sudden, you're right, Minister, Shiny turn up. And look, everybody's attention was on Shiny. The deceased had lived in her constituency once. She never forget those who served. I went to another funeral representing the, it was the leader of the opposition at that time, Portia Simpson Miller, the brother of MP, former MP Werner Parchment had died and Portia had asked me to go and pay a tribute on her behalf. This is at top of Fern Gully. So of course who turned up? Shiny. And notwithstanding that Vern had crossed the floor and all of that, politics played no role in that. She was a former devil MP, but I will say this, she may have, she may have left a shoe that is hard to fit. Her opponent has consistently garnered probably the fifth highest voter for any candidate in the nation, consistently over 10,000. So if our opponent was running in 50 other, other seats, our opponent would have won with the number of votes. But there must be something about China that pulled out all the votes she can get. We're going to miss her. Frankly, this is a case in which I say of my opponent, gone too soon. Gone too soon. And when I say opponent, I, I really mean it as part of the parliamentary family, because truth is center, Samuda. Sometimes we knock ourselves too hard. Sometimes we take sickness and curse each other. Sometimes we over critical of each other. But I've come to learn, certainly in this Senate, and I've said it before, when it comes to illness, we're a family. One family. We may criticize each other otherwise, but we care for each other. Even when we jostle with Senator Sinclair, we wish him the best. <laughs> we, wish him the best. we wish him the best. So, and I hope, Mr. President, in closing, that we could take the fact that parliamentarians are really part of a unique family. We may have disagreement within the family, but let's treat each other with respect and love. And I love Shiny Robinson because of the person she was. She was tough. She was tough. But she was respectful. She was decent. And above all, she was a woman of courage. May it please you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Brown. Mr. President, this has been a trying period for 
the members of the Jamaica Labour Party, and specifically those members who associate and are members through our area council three, including that of including that from Senator Morgan. We've lost former Mayor Milton Brown. We've lost Dr. Neville Gallimore. And we've lost Shaini Robinson, all within a very short period of time. And I think it should not be lost on us, the impact that it has had on members of the body politic on both sides, certainly within that area. I know the, the structure of the PNP is a little different in terms of how it groups itself, but certainly within that region it is a big hit to the body politic. It's funny that I actually was introduced to Dr. Gallimore by Minister Shaini Robinson. It was upon attending a funeral for a colleague at the time who was with us at G2K on the management executive, um, Dr. Tamika Peertz. She affectionately called her mama. It was her grandmother who had raised her in, in all things, it's, it's even in politics. And when you used to hear Tamika speak of Dr. Gallimore, who I had not yet met admittedly at that stage, you know, you'd have thought he was 10 feet tall. He, it was a sort of folklore when she would talk about how he would move with the community, how helpful he was to persons on both sides of the, 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 the political aisle, um, how fiercely he, he applied his political trade, but just how much of a connection he built with the people in his constituency. When he came to that funeral, that was very obvious. And um, it was odd because Mr. Robinson reached virtually at the same time. So you can imagine that there was not much focus on the pastor with those two political giants coming to what is a very small church at the same time. And um, she introduced me to Dr. Gallimore. You know, at the time, I was not yet an officer in, in G2K. But um, she said to Dr. Gallimore at the time, you know, yeah, this young one have a lot of potential. Give too much trouble, but have a lot of potential. And every single time I would see Dr. Gallimore after that, he would never forget the face and he would never not reach out. Um, there was even a time where I figured it, his number would, my number would have been given to him by Andrew, his son, where he called and, you know, he, he said, I really liked how you handled that interview. And, you know, it felt good. And the very next morning, he called and said, I really didn't like how you handled that one. <laughs> so <laughs> he certainly, from my limited experience with him, wasn't going to be a cheerleader at all costs. He would tell you how he felt about situations. So I certainly join in extending condolences to his family and friends, especially former MP Andrew Gallimore, and also to the family and friends of Mr. Milton Brown, former mayor. I rise specifically today, Mr. President, because of a, the relationship that I would have had with former Minister Shaini Robinson. I rise to pay tribute to a uniquely and unique and multifaceted patriot who touched in a positive way the careers and lives of so many of the younger cohort in the political space, including mine. All of us will recall when we started the political process. There's often a distrust that older members have of younger members. Political parties are not always the most welcoming things. The political process is oftentimes a fierce battle with how we do things, so persons aren't always open-armed for new members. That was never the case with Ms. Shaini Robinson. As I begin, though, I wish to attach myself to much of the remarks made about her by her colleagues whose presentations preceded mine here, both in this house and in the other place. Mr. President, it is no coincidence that so many people in Jamaica, and particularly North East St. Anne, are in mourning and in a state of bereavement. That's because there is no doubt that the occasion of the passing of Shahini Elizabeth Fakuri Robinson meant that we've lost a unique and genuine servant of the people. 
we have lost a great Jamaican, a woman who had other options but chose to walk the walk in giving distinguished service to her beloved people of Northeast St. Anne and by extension Jamaica. Shahini Robinson's contribution to the lives of the people of Northeast St. Anne and her country is a matter of public record. President, we need not wait, await the written submissions of learned historians and knowledgeable scribes to now acknowledge that when the noble and sometimes challenging art of being a true representative of, of the people is concerned, Shahini Robinson, Auntie Shai, Miss Rob, was the genuine article. As far as our constituents are concerned, Mrs. Robinson was their trusted advisor. She was their strong advocate for development. She was their foremost engineer for positive social change. She was their, in her own words, chief social worker. She was their confidant. She was their dear and committed friend. And anyone who has been into St. Anne when she's around would know that. Mrs. Robinson's contribution to her constituency was stellar. It is no wonder that shortly after her passing, her former employee, constituent, and friend, Patrick Fitton, posted the following words to Facebook. You did not just leave a mark here in Northeast St. Anne. You left a whole legacy. We have lost our defender, our leader, our MP. Those of us who knew Shiny Robinson well know that her only motivation for being involved in politics was to better the lives of her fellow citizens of Jamaica. She had, she had a motherly instinct. You could see that with how she applied care, and you could see that with how she applied discipline. I can tell you quite frankly, I was on both sides at different times in my political career. She would have had, she would have, well, I'll share that with you all after. Um, but there was, an, there was a time when we were young and we were getting ourselves into some trouble. And there was a time, it was in her constituency, and she found herself in the middle of a politically uncomfortable position in managing a situation between myself and some friends and former MP candidate, Manley Bowen, and his, his son. And the way she navigated that was, was something to behold. It, it, ended, it ended in a way that brought um, parties together. So no matter where it started, it ended with persons on the same page and it coming together. And that was, was something to, to be acknowledged. No, I wasn't actually there when that would have taken place, but I went after. I went after. It's all as well, man. I was therefore not surprised that the words written a few days ago by her niece and my friend Gianna Fakuri, words to the effect, Auntie Shahini, said that the best thing about politics was that it gave her the chance to help so many people. She loved her country. Shahini Robinson also gave excellent service on the national stage where she served in a number of capacities including Minister of Labor and Social Security. President. When Mrs. Robinson, Mrs. Robinson quietly and persistently lobbied for and eventually announced an increase in the minimum wage, she did not do so because it was a good political move, but out of genuine recognition that it augured well for a betterment of her people. The very same applies to her advocacy for better working conditions for all, including, including those who were living with disabilities. President, it is my view that during the course of time, the appropriate authorities will deem it fit to accord Mrs. Robinson with the formal national recognition she so badly deserves. When all is said and done, Shahini Robinson's greatest asset was how genuine a person she was, her, her, her humility and her preparedness to give her very best of her to her family, friends, associates, and in general, to her people, whether she knew them for many years or had just met them. President, I will not be much longer. Much has been said about Miss Rob. But I must say, for some time, as she battled the illness, and I, check, and I would check in with her from time to time, I'd quietly wish that the day would not come where we'd have to utter these words. President, I'll recall the last time I spoke to her. It was actually coming back from a trip 
Um, it was an oceans meeting that I was returning through and I had to fly through Miami. And though I'd been speaking to her pretty often, I hadn't seen her in some time. So her appearance did catch me off guard. It was one of the last times she would have been able to go for treatment. And she brought two things to my memory as she was telling me, um, you know, we were, we were having conversation. The first of the two was, she reminded me of the last meeting before the 2016 general polls when yourself and myself would have gone down to speak at a meeting in Ocho Rios Square. Yes, and um, she reminded me having to ask me to, um, to rein in then leader of, of opposition business in the Senate while he was presenting. Um, it was an exuberant presentation in Ocho Rios Square from the president. The other, the other thing that she said to me as we were prepared, downstairs, when you guys join us for lunch. Um, the other thing that she said to me at the time, she said, you know, Matty, you have to take care of yourself. Life is short. And this was as I was about to sip a Pepsi, and she said, that's that. So I leave it. I leave the stories there until another time. But alas, I know I have lost a valuable political mentor, friend, and a woman to me who was like an aunt and a trusted advisor. I will miss her, but I am comfort, comforted that she has made her mark. Her pain is no more, and she is resting comfortably in the presence of her maker. May her family find the strength to navigate these difficult times, and may light perpetually shine upon her. Minister. Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Samuda. Senator Morrison. Mr. President, I support the sentiments expressed by all our colleagues this morning. Dr. Neville Gallimore, how best can we remember him? He was accessible to the people. He allowed no barrier to stand between him and his constituents. He had a special connection with them, especially farmers with whom he shared his knowledge of crop and livestock. He treated people with respect. And Mr. President, this is not a factor to glide over. He valued every constituent, regardless of their economic status. That had no bearing on how he interacted with them. Whether you're a manager or whether you are a groundsman, the level of respect was the same. Constituents describe him as a jovial MP, a nice man, a people person. Dr. Gallimore was passionate about development. The only high school in the constituency, about not Gallimore High, was built during his tenure as member of parliament. Several roadways were also constructed and many communities received electricity. Dr. Neville Gallimore, he is a sterling example of what service is about. The Honorable Xavier Main, Member of Parliament for Southwest St. Anne, identifies Dr. Gallimore as the person who prepared him for service in politics. What a man. May his soul rest in peace. Mr. President, in respect of the Honorable Shahini Robinson, Minister of Labor and Social Security, Member of Parliament for Northeast St. Anne. What a woman. What a phenomenal woman. What a woman who is an example to other women out there who may want to step into politics. When Shahini passed, grown men cried. Grown men wept openly because she was so immersed in the lives of her constituents. In fact, I don't think any other member of parliament has the record for attending 
the most funerals in one day, as did Shahini. Very regularly, constituents share stories that they'll just be at home and Shahini would just arrive at the gate. And when they come out and say, MP, what? Mm, she said, nothing. Me just, you ran across my mind and I just decided that I was going to drive and come and visit you. She loved the people and the people loved her. The story is told that her constituents, if they went somewhere to do business and they felt that they were being treated unfairly, you'd only see them flash out them phone and say, me I go call shiny. And behold, when they called Shiny, she answered. And people could actually start doing the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Shiny is going to be on the phone. And she's going to be investigating what happened. She was that firm hand in a velvet glove. Gentle enough to hush a baby but strong and formidable in fighting for the rights of her people. At mass meeting, Senator, when Shahini entered the meeting and she touched the platform, you could feel the love emanating from supporters who right across Jamaica. She was a firebrand. She was something to behold. She was tough talking. Also, I am amused by the story <laughs> that once there was a young man who called her on phone and I think he was being very disrespectful, uttered to her some choice words. And Shahini calmly said, you know the gas station down the road? Meet me down there and tell me about the same thing where you tell me later. <laughs> when Shahini arrived at the gas station, all calls to that number went unanswered because the Shahini who we know, if him did ever turn up, all she would say is, young man, change your ways. I mean, <laughs> that's the woman. But Mr. President, love of the people is our strongest legacy. And I do believe, as parliamentarians, we are ever reminded, do not enter if you cannot commit to your constituents. Do not enter politics if you don't have true and genuine love for the people. Do not enter it if you can't do it from your heart. We know that the people, St. Anne's Bay, Ocherios, Lime Hall, Exchange. We, when they meet, Mr. President, they all share stories of where they were when they got the bad news. And we encourage her constituents, remember her with love. Your MP was a passionate woman, a fire woman, a woman who don't back. Protect her legacy. Shahini, beautiful woman loyal woman. May her soul rest in peace. Minister? Um, I think I will just say a short word. I'm so sorry. Um, Senate, thank you, Senator Morrison. <laughs> Senator Graham? Yes. Um, Mr. President, thank you, colleagues. I didn't have the privilege of personally meeting. Thank you. I personally meeting um, Dr. Gallimore, but clearly from what has been said, he was a man of good report. And I thank his family and himself for the service that he has given to his constituents and Jamaica, and we are indeed grateful. In relation to Mrs. Robinson, I had I met her under two interesting but separate circumstances. 
the, the one of the very few ICOPs that she had in her representation had to do with the visa issues that came up that caused her to, ha to be involved in a by-election. And um, during that time, I met her for the, the first time. And she took it all in strides. And um, even when issues of costs came up, and she assured me that under no circumstances she could afford to pay that type of cost. And even if she could, she would prefer to spend it on the people instead of paying it to certain people. So she had a certain commitment in relation to her people. She considered herself a social worker more than anything else. That issue was resolved, and it was to be bear me in good stead subsequently. I sort of was sort of storing up pearls for the future without knowing because I then became the chairman of the Urban Development Corporation. Now, the Urban Development Corporation, Mr. President, owns assets in her constituency. And those assets, as far as she was concerned, was for the benefit and use of the people. She knew the assets well, but she knew almost every worker or craft vendor that either work or did business at, the, at these assets, Don's River being the most important. But to show you her particulars in terms of detail, she called me on one occasion to ask if I knew a particular lady, who she described as a cleaner and that she worked in a particular area, in one of the bathroom sections and so on. So I said, well, Minister, I don't really know her. She said, but how you come you don't know her? I know her, aren't you the chairman? <laughs> I was very perplexed, but I couldn't say anything. Um, she said, uh, clearly, she was of the view that as the chairman, I had a responsibility to know every person that works in the organization. And when they had difficulties, I was expected to personally solve it. And I had many calls like that, where she expected me to personally solve any particular issue <clears throat> of unfairness that she considered. And that had to do with the fact that the employee was employed for many years, probably a decade, on a temporary basis. Um, but she didn't have the qualification. And so the question was asked, so what CXC and we have to do with cleaning a toilet? And that was a very powerful question. No doubt, with our agitation, that situation and a lot of others was set right. But, but um, she, I had a call from her at least once a month concerning matters of the UDC and how it is dealing with in the parish and in her um, constituency. And I was once summoned by her to a tour of a certain part of the constituency where the UDC had some beach land that she thought was better suited for a fish, a, 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 a sea fisherman's beach, and that the fishermen were not being taken care of and so on. So I said, yes, I will come, but I'm going to Montego Bay. It's about 1 o'clock. I will come at about 10. It's, you know, the minister said it would only take 10 minutes and so on. We agreed to meet, Mr. President. We did meet before 10. She said that she would drive, and it would take us a few minutes. On the way, she spotted somebody. She stopped, jumped out of her vehicle, and would not return. The next thing, I was walking with her. But I didn't worry myself, because I mean, I had four hours or so <clears throat> to go, and it's only 10 minutes the most. Suffice it to say that I did not make the meeting because she basically decided to speak to everybody that she met. Then when she passed certain areas, she reminded me that she hadn't seen Miss Mavis over there in a long time. I wonder what happened to her. And I was dragged along to visit them too. 
And uh, what was amazing to me is that they, they were not wearing name tags, President. But she knew, she, well, she knew them because she asked them about the daughter that had a baby last month and that the first child had passed GSAT and was going to this school. And then she raised a question about another one who was a bit worthless. If him stop smoke ganja. I was, I was amazed that she knew, it appeared, everybody. And they answered the questions and so on. And then when they left, she said, well, you know, that one is not as faithful as you should. But we don't mind him still. I won't say what is the unfaithfulness that she mentioned. <laughs> Well, I think Senator Brown knows the unfaithfulness um, that she would express. And what I would say, <clears throat> if I, which would not, well, if I were to be an MP myself, I wish I would have had that capacity to love people in, the, in the, that way, regardless regardless of their color, regardless of who they are, regardless and just regardless and to give unwittingly and unswervingly of self. That was the experience I had with her. I missed the meeting, but I, would have, I will cherish that day's walk for the rest of my life. And so I, it was a privilege meeting this lady. I don't know her as well as others did, but I could expect the call once a month. And I'll tell you how, as I end, how the court case would help me. Because when she called sometimes, she would be very strong and strident. And if it was necessary to accuse me of being wicked, she would. Yes? Um, and at the end of it, she would say, but I can't have you up. I can't have you up. Because, you know, I always remember the good case. I always remember the good case. So it was a privilege dealing with her. And I pray for her rest and comfort to our family. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Longmore. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to add my voice to the expressions here this morning. Um, I won't be long, but all three stalwarts of the Jamaica Labour Party that we have lost, I can relate to in different ways. And let me start with former councillor Milton Brown. I'm from Clarendon. I went to Glenmere High School. He had twin daughters, Tina and Keisha, and we were classmates right throughout high school. And at that time, I did not know that Mr. Brown was as politically oriented and as involved in the community as he was because what I knew of him was that he was their father and he exemplified that. A very caring gentleman and later on I came to know that he had this political role and I started to appreciate him the way that his care, the persons in his care appreciated him. And I will just want to offer my sincere condolences to Tina and Keisha, who are my friends, at the loss of a father, and to the community that he served, at the loss of someone who held their best interest at heart in all his endeavors. May his soul rest in peace. Dr. Neville Gallimore and Honorable Shahini Robinson were both political icons that I grew up hearing of and later came to meet in different ways. Dr. Gallimore, what I know of him is more on his family side and the dedicated father that he was. I also know of him professionally. There are very few medical doctors who go on to do the level of service that he has done and still maintain a medical practice and still is able to connect not just with constituents 
but to also connect with patients and see to the care on that level where persons, no matter where, and this is a mark of a good physician, no matter where, when they are in need, they will find you. And that physician will make time for that individual. And I have heard many accounts of the professional that Dr. Gallimore was in the medical field. And I just want for us to recognize that aspect of his service to country and to people in addition to what we know of, of him politically. I will now go to MP Robinson, former minister, minister, former in the state that she now exists. For me, clearly, it hits in a different way. Um, suffice to say that MP Robinson not only broke through the glass ceiling, she shattered it. And she has left a mark politically that not just women, but men aspire to. I will dare say that if I were to serve in that capacity, or if anyone were to serve in that capacity, it is how she did it that I would want to do it. She served long. She served in a dedicated way. We have heard tremendous accounts of her personable approach. And throughout that time, there was no controversy around her service. There was no questions as to her motives. And that is something that I think we all need to recognize and celebrate because she held service to the people, I think, as her paramount objective. When I was going through my battle, MP Robinson was one of the persons who reached out to me, as many did. But I felt especially secured by her reaching out because of her nature of comfort, her natural nature of caring. And when it came to the point where I had to return the favor and I had to return the sentiment, it rocked me really hard because there is a particular phenomena that happens called survivor guilt. <laughs> when persons go through life-changing events and things that can alter your life, and you wonder, why did you survive? Why not someone else? And all I can say is that that is yet unknown. But MP Robinson, in her way, helped me to realize how that may be possible. She has been, from I started to show, to show some political interest, she has always been a guide. She has pulled me aside. She has said, approach this this way. And she has always offered help. And the tremendous thing about her is that she is absolutely non-judgmental. She allows you to be your own person and to find your own way, but with a very maternal undertone to it all. If you are to make mistakes, she will allow you to make the mistakes, but she will allow you to also recognize and help you process that mistake. As I said, I won't be long, but I just want us to recognize the role of a woman who helped to propel 
women within our society. Growing up, we all as young girls see the images of success amongst us. And MP Robinson was one of those very few females who maintained her femininity throughout her service. And even though she was there dealing with the big, big issues that you usually see the suits, the men in suits deal with. She was very aptly dressed, very feminine, very soft-spoken, but delivering a charge that none could challenge. May her soul rest in peace. May Dr. Gallimore's soul rest in peace. May Mayor Wilton Brown's soul rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. I ask you to rise and observe a moment's silence in recognition to the departed souls of members of parliament, Gallimore, Robinson, and Mayor Brown. One moment's silence, please. and light perpetually shine upon them. Thank you very much, members. Um, I direct that the clerk will write the appropriate missive to the families of persons who we recognized today, and that you send copies of the Hansard along with the letter in the hope that the fact that the Senate recognized them may be some comfort to them in their time of their bereavement. Statements by ministers. Announcements. Laid on the table of the Senate today are the following. Annual report of the Management Institute for National Development Mine for the year 2018-2019. Annual report of the Land Administration and Management Program LAMP Fund for the year 2013-2014 and 2014-2015. Annual report of Land Divestment for the year 2018-2019. Annual reports of the Scientific Research Council for the years 2016-17 2017-18. Capital Development Fund Withdrawal Number 1 Order 2020 under the Bauxite Production Levy Act. Bauxite and Alumina Industries Special Provisions Clarendon Alumina Production Limited Associated Producer Order 2020. And Bauxite of, and Alumina Industries Special Provisions Clarendon Alumina Production Limited Associated Producer Order 2020 Resolution. The Bauxite and Alumina Industries Special Provisions, General Alumina, Jamaica Limited Associated Producer Order 2020. Bauxite and Alumina Industries Special Provisions, General Alumina, Jamaica Limited Associated Producer Order 2020 Resolution. 
All these are under the Bauxite and Alumina Industry Special Provisions Act. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Bills brought from the Honorable House of Representatives, petitions, papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally, questions and answers to questions, motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice, motions for leave to introduce bills, the presentation of bills without the leave of the Senate first obtained, public business. Minister. Mr. President, uh, the agenda today has one single item, and that is the completion of the Data Protection Act. Uh, it is intended to continue the debate, uh, which last uh, heard Senator Morgan deliver his rather excellent presentation, if I do say so, <laughs> once more. Uh, but we start this morning with the other side and invite the continued discussion of what is, as we recognized last week, I uh, believe one of the more important pieces of legislation that will pass before us during this tenure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scott Motley. Thank you, Mr. President. After such an emotional morning, you almost feel like you should pack up and leave. But based on the personality and nature of the three persons who we are celebrating this morning, I think that would distress them considerably because they understand that this kind of work must go on. So, Mr. President, I rise to make a short presentation on the Data Protection Act of 2020. I was a member of the Joint Select Committee established to consider the legislation. And so I begin with commendations for, and thanks to the excellent guidance provided by the technical team, led by Joaquin Murray and Cadian Smith, from the Ministry of Science, Energy, and Technology, to the Chief Parliamentary Counsel, the Solicitor General, the able members of the Attorney General's Department, the Legal Reform Department, and all others who worked on this significant piece of legislation. I have become myself a fan of joint select committees, and I think we will see the benefit when we reach the committee, as we will no doubt be proceeding rather quickly. I do not want, however, Mr. President, for the impression to be given that this Joint Select Committee actually sit for, sat from November 2017 and did not produce a report until very recently. There are people who say that they don't want things to go to a Joint Select because it takes too long. The truth of this matter is that we started in November, established a framework and all that, but after Minister Wheatley uh, stepped away from his ministry, there was a break of over a year. And I say this also because I think Minister Favel Williams must be commended for the work that she did When she was appointed, she had a fixity of purpose, and all the members who sat understood, understand what I'm talking about. It was challenging to keep up with her. She was so determined to see this legislation through. And her dedication and commitment was very evident from the very inception of her chairmanship. Mr. President, it has been said before that this legislation is of profound significance. It is. The Constitution of Jamaica recognizes the right to privacy as a fundamental right guaranteed under the Charter of Rights. And the purpose of this legislation is to acknowledge that our data belongs to us. It is our property. 
It is to ensure the confidentiality of personal data which may be in the possession of entities, including government authorities, and to provide for the rights of individuals in relation to their personal data in the possession of other entities. And when we had this the onslaught and onset of COVID, and the government had to now be dealing with the COVID grants, I think that was the most timely reminder of the necessity for legislation of this nature. Because in order to access the grants, you literally had to give the government significant data about yourself, your personal information, your name, your address, your occupation, your street address, your telephone number, your email address, you, your TRN, the place of employment, and bank accounts. So there's all this data being collected and stored in one place. So this act, had it been in place, would have ensured that the information was only used for the purpose for which it was collected and that any breach would be severely punished. Mr. President, I think that Senator Morgan did an, made an excellent presentation. I can't say that when he was finished I was consoled. Because what it reminded me is that in spite of all the precautions which are taken, data being so valuable, the new gold as people call it, is a subject matter of many attacks. And so even though we have the legislation, it's a safeguard for entities which are scrupulous and have integrity. But your data is out there, vulnerable to all those others who just see it as a commodity to be traded. I don't know quite how we are going to deal with that. I mean, when we learned that a financial institution had inadvertently shared all information, very sensitive information with a number of persons, when we learned that bank accounts are being hacked and movements made money move from one account to the other, it is almost frightening to understand your vulnerability and the vulnerability of the system. But we, I think, have done the best job that we were able to do. And I, I, I say personally that the patience demonstrated by the team as we wrestled with some of the matters is really commendable. I am particularly proud of the oversight committee which we established because we felt that the information commissioner had too, too much power concentrated in one office and in one person. I believe that what the hybrid situation that we developed is going to work and is going to work very well. For those of us too who had some concerns, the fact that you, you, you were able to at least insulate yourself from the barrage of direct advertising, that was something that we, we spent a lot of time developing uh, a clause that would deal with that which, in a way that we think is also commendable. But I want to actually sound a word of caution because when I heard um, Senator Morgan say that now we could move on to NIDS, in a couple of months we would be looking at NIDS. I, not as simplistic as that. It, it was true that I, I, it was true. It was not as simplistic as that, but the intent was clear. I want to say that you can see the benefits, Senator Morgan, in our Joint Select Committee. We heard from we had 26 different persons and entities make submissions. We had huge corporations. We had financial institutions. We had individuals. And I think it enhanced the outcome 
of the, 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 the legislation. The legislation really changed significantly as we went along. And I think that it was very important that persons were allowed to make their contribution. I think that it is well recognized that the role of the Data Protection Act in regards to privacy is very significant. In fact, I recall distinctly in the case of Julian Robinson and the Attorney General that, that the Attorney General's submission that the, let the action was premature was predicated on a presumption that there was, it was going to, there was going to be significant legislation, it was going to be a framework, and that one of the framework was a data protection law to be enforced. How soon will the Data Protection Act be able to come into force is therefore very relevant. Because there is no provision in the budget for data protection for this year. None. And one of the points which the consultant made was that the first step would have to be to establish the Office of the Information Commissioner. That cost, if my memory serves me right, is $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion. So it's not, a, it's not an amount that, especially no, especially no, when there are other pressing requirements of the government, as significant as this is, it's not going to be easy to find. We also agreed that one of the things that also came out was that we would have to have, uh, the, that the legislation would have to, as, different aspects would have to come into effect at different times. And we knew that the first aspect of it would have to be to set up the information, uh, the office, because the office would have to be functioning in order to carry out its work. So, so I don't want the public to be left with the impression that in a short time this will be done because it's not so. But I think that the time that we have should be gainfully spent by having the widest possible public education. You see, almost everybody collects data now. Almost everybody, once you use um, one of those mobile machines or so, you're collecting people's information. And I know that one of the things that we have discussed is who will have to be registered, who will, how wide we will cast in it. But I think that the public education is critical for those who will have to be collecting data and for those whose data will be collected. So I want us to use that time to really educate the public in whatever way that we can. You know, Mr. President, every so often, you come across legislation which in its significance sometimes you forget that there are some people who will get left behind. You will forgive me, I don't think I'm going off track, when I say that every time I think about data protection I think about needs. It's just in my mind inextricable twinned for many reasons. The private sector and other entities have been calling for this speedy implementation. There have been articles which have praised Estonia and which says that Jamaica has the opportunity to be the new Estonia. But there's a critical difference in my view because Estonia laid the framework, a very critical framework for what it had to do. 
And for example, adults, you know those people who have to call their grandchild to come and, we, we experience that, call grandchild to come and set up the thing for them. Adults were given computer classes for free. And in very short order, every child had a computer in their hand so that they were very familiar with the whole concept of what they were going to have to do. You see, why it concerns me, you talk about Shahini Robinson. You talk about representation. I don't think there's anybody on any side who can deny that she was an excellent member of parliament. And I don't know her constituency well, but she would have thought about the old lady living in a one room who don't even have a radio and the requirements which were going to be placed on her by the government who is there to protect her. She would have thought about the person, the young student who now has to do lessons online and can't get any service because there's no internet available where they live. So I put it in that context so that you understand where I'm coming from, Mr. President. That is to say, when you have a strong desire to implement something, you have to make sure that the infrastructure, both the mental, the physical, and the spiritual infrastructure is there to support it. So the private sector can talk all they want. What they must do is come on board to assist in laying the groundwork for what it is what they want to achieve. My concern is I don't want this to be a, subject, a society where only certain people can access the benefits or access the possibilities and some people are left behind. And I urge the government, I urge the government to begin to have the conversations which are necessary to make sure that in our haste to become a digital society, we don't leave half of the population behind. We already have a problem with how our educational system is structured. And I, I, I repeat, COVID has taught us many lessons. We have so many things we can take away from COVID. And what we have to take away is that we have not prepared our teachers properly for this new age. We have not prepared our students properly for this new age. And sadly enough, there are a whole host of people out there who are not in touch at all who literally have no access to information. If we put all this in the mix, if we understand and appreciate the problems which we have as a country, then that is the first step in applying the solution. So, Mr. President, my final point is the cost that is going to impose on businesses. We have to take that into consideration too. Because some of those small businesses just simply cannot afford to spend another dollar. Their backs are broken. I don't know what we are going to do with it, how we are going to do it. We know that registration, we have suggested that regis registration will be the free for the first, first time registrants. But I think that we're going to have to do a little bit more in terms of having some kind of organization who, that can offer them some assistance in the beginning in some way or the other. It's not a developed thought. I'm not making a sophisticated recommendation, but I'm saying that it's something also that when we do in the public education and our planning, we have to take into consideration. But I must say, I'm proud of the work that we have done. I think we did a good job. Again, thanks to the team. If it pleases you, Mr. President.
Thank you, Senator Scott Mottis. Senator Gale. Mr. President, you know, as senators, we have some primary responsibilities. We come to Parliament and we shape policies through motions that would have been tabled and debated. We would have made amendments to primary legislation. But one of the key responsibilities that we embark on and that we must always acknowledge and recognize for ourselves is as legislatures, when we take a legislation from scratch and make it into a new legislation that is monumental, and we're up, we, we become part of history. This is a new legislation coming at the right time when it is needed badly. And Mr. President, I want to, I want to commend the government for bringing this legislation to the fore when it is badly needed. Joint select committees, extremely important. Extremely important. Because it gives the opportunity to give the legislation that level of probity that it deserves. And I want to commend the joint select committee and the minister who took charge of it to have brought it to this level. It's commendable. I also I want to commend the technical team for the work that they have done. But not only for the work that they have done, but for putting up with the Joint Select Committee because it could not have been an easy task. But we are where we are today. No, I was not a member of the Joint Select Committee. I must declare that. But I look at the composition of the Joint Select Committee. <laughs> and I can understand and appreciate the level of work that would have gone in. Yes. Mr. President, this is a very important piece of legislation that is far-reaching and might be one of the most important we will pass in this, in this sitting of Parliament. There are some legislations that will be supportive of another because of its scope and objective. This is one legislation that will endeavor to do so. I want to consider this legislation as one also that is seeking to protect the rights of workers. And I will explain later on. But the world has changed. It continues to change. It is changing as we speak. Mr. President, if, inter if the Internet was another planet, then we'd be visiting that other planet oftentimes. Because every downtime that we get, every spare time that we get, we check our phone and we go online. And online has become the order of the day. You, you do examinations online, you register online, you do applications online, you shop online. When I look in this parliament, you know, I know that there are persons in this parliament that shop online. The, the Amazons and the Ebays. And when I look at the shoes that some people wear, I know they shop online. When I look at the handbag that some people carry, I know they shop online. When I look at... Well, well, <laughs> The, the jewelry and, and Senator Scott Motley. I know they shop online. And there's a truth to it, Mr. President, because none of them has 
stood up to raise an objection that I'm misleading the parliament. No point of order. <laughs> Mr. President, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, sir, has provided valuable guidelines aimed at addressing issues of personal data which impacts the employment field and there are noted specific provisions in these statutes that are quite relevant within the employment and the labor field. The broad consensus sir, is that the interaction of this legislation prov provision places a considerable duty on the employer to ensure that the worker's personal information is safeguarded and that there can be painfully costly sanctions. Mr. President, the obligations of it you know, compels the employer to carefully consider the types and range of information required from their employees and its usage once obtained. This bill, sir, for the most part, embodies such principles strengthening from who receives the coverage to the employee's right to be informed of the processing of their data and the right to access the same. The bill sir, also creates the independent office known as the Information Commissioner, establishing Section 4 to monitor and to provide guidance on the application and the provisions of the appropriate cases. The workers, sir, they must know that employers now have concrete direction on how to address the protection of their data. And this comes in the case of, you know, recruitment and selection, dealing with employees' records. So you are employed, you are part of an organization, but you have to submit certain critical, pertinent information as an employee. And Mr. President, you want to be satisfied that that piece of information, that piece of data is protected. You have situations where just carrying out your duties, your work is being monitored by driven data because of the systems and processes that you use. And even the processing of employees' medical information. One of the things now you know, is that, that is being done is if you apply for sick leave, employers are now having a prescribed form that tracks when you go off and when you return and to the extent that you are, you are, you are good to come back to work. And so your personal information and your data is being captured in many ways. Mr. President, you know, there are Caribbean countries who would have looked at these data protection, the Bahamas, the Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua, Barbados. What the Act stipulates is that there are some general standards in terms of how you treat with the application of the employee's records. And the ILO promotes a code of practice in terms of how that is administratively treated. Key in the legislation, Mr. President, is the distinction between personal data and sensitive personal data. And I make reference to it because in section 2, pers sensitive personal data, and it means personal data considering, consisting of any of the following information in respect of a data subject. It says A, generic data or biometric data, B, affiliation or racial or ethnic re origin, C, political opinions, philosophical beliefs, religious beliefs, or the beliefs of a similar nature. D, membership to any trade union. E, physical or mental health or condition. 
F Sex Life G, the alleged commission of any offense by the data subject or any proceedings from any offense alleged to have been committed by the data subject. I pick this one out because, Mr. President, I consider this grouping of homogeneous in nature that is exposed to the risk of discrimination. And that is what I believe this particular clause is seeking to protect. The exposure to discrimination. And Mr. President, let me say it, that in today's world, any act that can protect discrimination must be supported. Mr. President, the time being 1.19, might the Senate sit beyond 1.30 to complete the business of the day? Members have heard the question. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Aye. Thank you, Senator Gale. Thank you, President. I find that the gavel is extremely loud today. <laughs> well, Mr. President, you know, I, I speak... I sp we, I speak against discrimination. And this is what this clause is seeking to do, have a protection. And Senator Brown, you know how trade unionists and trade union, being a member of trade unions, we face discrimination. And notwithstanding the fact that the labor movement would have been the backbone and foundations of the building of many economies. But Mr. President, the bill is seeking to establish independent bodies to monitor the operations of its provisions and to ensure the relevant enforcement mechanisms are created to bolster the administrative process. The administrative authority is also empowered to consult with private enterprise to encourage the creation in the in-house code of practices. Senator Scott Motley spoke of the education and this consultation that would take place between the state and the private enterprise should be aimed in that strategic initiative to develop the code of practice. This is how we go and operate. Because you, you pass the legislation today, but how do you operate after that? And I, I raise that concern in terms of a code of practice because this piece of legislation is one that a lot has been called for its passage. Just like a lot of persons today are talking about the flexible work arrangement, that we need the flexible work arrangement, not understanding that it is there, but what is absent from it is a code of practice to guide. And I recall when I was sitting in a chair over there, I was asking the same question for the development of a code of practice. Because that code of practice allows for the education and awareness that you spoke about. That is so critical after the passage of this legislation. Because we're going to have to understand and appreciate how is it that we're going to protect data, what is it going to be anchored on, and how we're going to facilitate the effectiveness of such an important piece of legislation. Mr. President, again, the workers have raised a critical issue. And I want to deal with a critical area of concern of data protection of which many workers have raised the issues and that this legislation is now seeking to protect. One extremely personal source of an individual information is their biometric profile. Their biometric profile. And biometrics are refers to methods which are utilized for the purpose of recognizing and identifying persons based on their unique physiological or behavioral traits. So fingerprints, hand and palm geometry, Face and iris recognition, as well as voice, is a way of collecting 
one's biometrics. Mr. President, in recent times, many enterprises have been begun utilizing biometric time and attendance system instead of what is considered the outdated time and card machines to streamline their workforce, protect their property, and maybe to enhance their productivity levels. So most methods of applying biometrical technology sir, generally require the user to utilize one of such biometric, biometric traits, maybe the fingerprint or the voice recognition, to just to enter or exit the workplace. So you enter some workplace now, you're using your fingerprint. Personal data. The system sir, is commonly operated as a disincentive to employee dishonesty in relation to timekeeping and to keep tabs on employees' whereabouts whilst at the workplace and sometimes even to measure their output and efficiency. And some of these systems, Mr. President, are even associated with accounting software so a worker may not be paid unless the system verifies their presence at work during that particular pay period. It is therefore clearly evident, Mr. President, that the use of such mechanisms present challenges to individual privacy. As in order to engage them, the worker must provide their personal information to the employer as source data to initialize its usage. And so this presents a clear interface with data protection principles, making it all more important that the proper systems are instituted to, to safeguard sensitive data. And Mr. President, legislation of this nature must protect the workers' privacy must protect the workers' privacy. So the use of fingerprint, as we predominantly know it, sir, is for law enforcement, or you, more, you know more than anyone else and Senator Skeffrey, electoral purposes. And the essential principle here is that even if it's mandated by law, an individual fingerprint shall be used only for the stipulated purpose suggested by the enabling legislation. And it ought not to be shared without the consent, without the agreement. The significance of fingerprinting and biometrics has undoubtedly, Mr. President, expanded its reach in employment arena as a conditions of employment or to guarantee in some cases the continuity of employment. And against this background, I beg to ask the following questions. Is the employee obligated to provide the employer with this personal information in the absence of an outlined contractual provision to safeguard against misuse? The second question I would want to ask, does a worker refusal to do, to, to do so empowers the employee to take punitive action against the worker? What if the worker was to leave the job? Can they claim constructive dismissal? And so, Mr. President, it is important, and I know that in Section 2 of the legislation, it is seeking to make provisions to protect the workers. But it becomes increasingly important for the workers to understand that there is a piece of legislation that is aimed at making provisions to protect them. So the two questions you have is what? Tell me the two questions again. There are three questions. Is the employer obligated to provide the employer with this, this personal information in the absence of an outline contractual provision to safeguard against misuse? Does, the workers does a worker's refusal 
to do so empowers the employer to take punitive action against the worker. And number three, what if the worker was to leave the job or be feel that they were forced to leave the job? Can they claim constructive dismissal? Because of the because you don't want, you don't wish to give your personal information. And listen, those enterprises that would have instituted this use of biometric data, the workers, your fingerprint, you know, is your personal thing, you know, you don't know where it go, and workers have raised concerns. That's, that's what that's, that's what just, that the workers would have raised concerns. Mr. President, these are areas of concern that have been expressed and is worthy of examination in every employment relationship. And whilst management has the prerogative to institute new contractual arrangement, it must always be grounded with broad contractual principles. Mr. President, the, the, the legislation spoke about a, a critical area, a critical function, that of the role of the data controller. It's a very important, critical function. If the data controller is a, it's an individual or a body, and there are many organizations today that depends on a data controller to manage their data. You, you look at those that have to deal with a suite of customers, massive customer base, and just think of credit checks. Just think of the, finance, the, the banks and the insurance company that have this wide cross-section. Senator Brown you may have recalled a situation at the National Housing Trust where customer information came into the public domain. And one of the worst things we want in life, you know, is to know that your information that you have given to an organization that is confidential in nature would have been exposed. And so it's critical, the role of the data controller is critical to understand the principles of the law and the policy that is being shaped, to be able to implement and to be held accountable for these principles. And their, their fundamental job is to understand the legislation and the role that governs it. And as the boss of all personal data, they are processing, th that is where the buck stops in the data controller. And so it requires thorough knowledge of all principles and how to apply in a specific situation. Another key area in my mind, Mr. President, is those eight standards that have been outlined in the legislation that, that are prescribed to the carrying out of the, the functions. Mr. President, this is a monumental piece of legislation. The enactment of a data protection legislation in Jamaica is a step in the right direction. In that, it creates positive, enforceable provisions and attempts to balance the contending rights of the parties within a specific legal framework. Sharing data, sir, does bring benefits, but it's not without risk, as new strategies to betray users' trust are invented each day, and it's getting scary. You don't know where your information is going. When I was encouraged to buy my bank to go online, for about three weeks, I, it became rough on me to just monitor my account. <laughs> no, it's a little bit of money that is in there, Senator Skeffrey. And, uh, Mr. President, 
you know, when, you, when, when the bank start giving you alerts to the fact that you have utilized your card, whether it be your debit card or your credit card, or you get the prompt. So one day, I got a prompt that I had used a credit card. And I said, but I didn't use my credit card. What is this? And I said, oh God, I share a credit card with my wife. And there it goes. <laughs> no, it's the same. It's the same. It's a, she have a separate one, but it's the same account. Mr. President, data protection is becoming more and more valuable. And the fact that personal data is shared and transferred instantaneously, it is important to protect personal information and that of companies. And if personal data size leaked, it can cause companies significant damages to their reputation and also bring penalties. So it's important for companies to comply with what we're seeking to pass as a legislation. And there are some fundamental reasons sir, why this government has pursued this comprehensive data protection law to address the realities of today. My only concern, sir, with the legislation is that I support it, I support the intent and the objective, it is coming at the right time. COVID-19 has expressively introduced to it the meanings why this legislation is so important. But, President, the world is in a digital age. We ought not to place ourselves in a mode where we have to catch up with the movement of the world because there are no borders and boundaries anymore in terms of how we operate in a digital age. My only recommendation, Mr. President, is that because technology moves so rapidly and it's changing and the transformation, I would want to recommend that the review period, be, the five years be substituted with three years. Well, I'd love to hear the reason. Well, maybe thereafter. What they, maybe thereafter. But because of the changes in the transformation of technology, we are, for digital, we are forced to contend with these things. And we are going to have to confront with artificial intelligence. So, Mr. President, the government has brought forward a very important piece of legislation. It must be commended for it. I support the objective. May it please you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Gill. Senator Skeffrey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to make my contribution to debate as we seek to pass this very important bill into law. Let me state from the onset that we on this side, as said by Senator Fraser Bins and our leader, Senator Dana Scott Motley, that we support the passage of the Data Protection Bill. And we look forward for it to come into law as quickly as possible. And by this, I mean that we start to operationalize it so it can benefit the country and all the citizens and protect our critical data that is generally loose in the public domain. Mr. President, we can all agree that protecting the privacy of personal and sensitive data in possession of public and private entities is absolutely necessary in our rapid changing society. And given the continued 
reliance on technology in the new digital space. This legislation, therefore, is critical as it seeks to define the rights of data owners who and how their data can be accessed and utilized, as well as penalties for the abuse and misuse of their data. Mr. President, let me stay. I will issue a warning. Senator Motley went there, but I want to reinforce that. Recently, we collected over 500,000 citizens' data in this COVID care package. So a lot of data for our citizens. And we need to ensure that though the law is not yet in effect, those who control that data must act in good faith and protect that data until it, the law comes to give it that legal backing. We must not share that data in any way, shape, or form for no purpose at all, and more so for no political purpose, Mr. President. I want to put that squarely. The citizens gave us, the government, their data because they are in need. They are in need, or they were. In fact, they are still in need. And they gave us the data in good faith. We must secure it and protect it, even though we don't have the legislation in place as yet, Mr. President. And we need to ensure that. Because that data is very, very critical. We don't want to use it for the wrong purpose. It was given for a specific purpose, and we need to protect it when we have no longer required it for that particular purpose. I just want to reinforce that, Senator Motley, because it's a good point you raise, and it's important that we protect people's data and don't use it for any other purpose than the intended purpose, Senator Gay. And I'm sure you will support me on that call. Mr. President, and the, 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 the bill supports that. If you look at Clause 25.1, it reinforces the need to protect the data of our, of our citizens. And it's also reinforcing 24.D.4 and 24 K6, so those three provisions in the law. And if those of us, we have the bill here, we can look at it. It, it reinforces the need to protect the data and to use the data for only for the purpose that it was intended. Mr. President, another critical provision in the bill that I support, Senator Fraser Beans raised it in her presentation. I want to give my support. I think it's a very critical clause. That is the one that deals with the consent for directing marketing, opting in versus opting out. Because I always wonder sometimes you have your phone and within five minutes you get this text message from that company, from that one and you wonder how everybody does know you, nobody but targeting you yeah. for different purposes. Right, and I thought I was. <laughs> but then when five other persons beside you say they got the same messages, they realize that you're not really special. There's a wide marketing and promotion that has been done. But it begs the question that here's your telephone, but what other data they have of you, these marketing companies. And therefore, I welcome this particular legislation and this particular provision, Clause 10.1, that protects the right. And we want to ensure that the notion of giving consent is not something that we just sweep along the way. And we hide it in the fine prints. So I come, for example, to get a telephone service or getting some Wi Fi service and have these long documents to complete and in the very, very fine prints. You sign and then you're told that you gave away quote unquote your rights. I want to urge those collecting data, the data controller at every point, please ensure that the citizens are well informed as to their rights and their obligations. Not in the fine print, but boldly and instructing them so they are aware as to what they are signing. So we want to ensure that this particular clause is used to the full effect as we move forward, Mr. President. It's clause 10. 10-1 in, in, in the, in the act. 
that speaks with the whole consent and directing marketing and so on. So very important, Mr. President, as we move forward. Now, again, we spoke about needs, and I remember when we were here up to that, about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and we spoke about the critical need for the data protection. It was one of the issues that arose in the Supreme Court ruling on needs was the absence of data protection legislation, Mr. President. And we on this side warned that it was needed. Almost, we said it was treated almost like a companion bill to the needs fight to give true effect to the needs. As usual, we were ignored, Mr. President. While it was not explicitly stated, we all knew that for the needs bill to operate, you need the protection under the data protection. And it was, in, it was the intention given then to bring both. But then for some other reasons, we went ahead with the needs and we saw the consequence in terms of the court ruling. So we need to ensure, Mr. President, that as we contemplate a new needs, we must be guided by provisions in our new Data Protection Act. And therefore, while we're going to pass this bill today, if we don't implement it, Senator Matley, as you said, then all the argument about needs and we need to move with needs, we'll go back to square one, Senator Gay. Because if the data protection is not operationalized, then all the issues you had previously will be there again. You spoke about security of the data. You see, you, you was a perfect example about them, the worker not want to give his or her fingerprint. And that was a critical part of the debate, I remember vividly. But I don't know because we're in, we're in the night that you understand you don't want to come, up, come into the collaborative reasoning that, that, that we saw. But we say it has to be optional, and that's the point you raised again. So even the data protection bill, if employers require your biometric data, for a particular purpose, and the worker refuses, as you ask the question, what is the recourse? How do you treat with that? So we want to ensure that the new needs bill will be guided, especially for, by Clause 26 in the data protection. The third standard, which, which states that personal data shall be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary for the purposes of which they are proposed. Let us seek to get it right the next time, Mr. President. See consensus, listen to content in views, and abide at all times by the Constitution of the land. Very critical. Mr. President, I also like the provision in the bill about the information commissioner. And what I also liked about it is the, the period of tenure, seven years, which basically cut across the life of a particular administration. So this person could have some greater confidence and a greater security of tenure in carrying out his or her role with a level of independence. So I think that's a, a good provision. Also, the appointment of the oversight committee I have to monitor the work. I have some concerns with that, but so I will go into shortly. But I think these are two provisions. The method of appointment also. We are seeking consensus. The Governor General, after consultation with the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition for the Information Commissioner and the Oversight, also two very good provisions in, 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 the, in the data protection. Because for this bill to work when it comes into law, the citizens have to have absolute confidence. Yes. Of not, not only of the procedure, but those who will be entrusted in carrying out yes. various aspects of the, not various, all aspects of the legislation. So the confidence is important. Because if we don't have a system with integrity, then you won't achieve. Don't care how well the clauses are worded, Mr. President. So I think that's a good, these two are two good provisions in the, in the bill as I move forward. I just have some concerns as I read two aspects of the bill. And I just ask some questions, some clarity and a few recommendations, not much as I go. For example, class 2, class 2, page 3, 
to page 4. When he speaks about the medical professions, I know probably we are using professions in the strictest definition, but I want to broaden it and probably to medical workers. But there are some that are excluded. I don't seek in guidance for those that are excluded. For example, a community health aid worker works in the health field, for example, in rural parts, said it again. These are the health workers that interface with the patients more directly. Because sometimes you don't have a doctor that goes there probably once a month, and the nurse probably once a week or twice a week. But that blue uniform worker is always there every day. And collect see, yeah, more so in the, in the health centers, community health centers. Yes. They collect critical data from the citizens. Because once you go to the health center, you have to register and give personal data, name, address, date of birth, the likes. So I don't see them here, for example. So I just want to know, we have listed some, so where would they fall, whether it's F, I just seeking some guidance. Right, and also laboratory technicians, the porter, you know that porter carries that docket <laughs> to one of the hospital, for example. I would in that brief moment, that porter will have access to critical data, not just personal in terms of your, your age and so on, but in terms of the illness. And that can become a, 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 a contending issue. So I want to know where would they fall here, so you know that they too has to fall in the ambit of the legislation. So they're seeking some guidance. Another question, simple page five. I see 30 years here. An individual, we're talking about personal data, and we say an individual who has been deceased for less than 30 years. I just procure, as I read it, what's the magic of 30 years? So somebody, somebody asked me, sent us careful, why did not put 20 years or 40 years? You're a full generation. OK, I, I thought so too. <laughs> so, I thought so too. So, but I just want to be, to be sure from the, the intent. Yeah, but for the policy, that, that seems to be a logical answer. But I want to know if that's within the policy, just to satisfy my curiosity. So, so we just don't choose a number, but the rationale for the selecting. So I also have that. As I turn to page 11, class 4, 8, do we have a timeline there? Page 11, class 4, 8, the Commission and me, at the written request of the data controller concern, assess any processing of personal data as to the following of good practice and shall inform the data controller of the result of the assessment. You know, but does it up to the, does the Commissioner's discretion as to when you provide the results? You know, if you're talking about efficiency and dealing with issues between the controller and the commission, should we not have some timeline so that we can eff effectively regulate all of these issues that may, may arise? So I just ask the question again, is it necessary not to have a timeline? If not, why not? So that's an observation I saw. I move quickly to page 44, and I twin two pages, because the issues are similar. Class 30, A and B, and Page 71, class 52, 4. I realize show the, the, the bill. When there are breaches, you have both a page class 30, that's page 44, and class 52, page 71. But as I read the bill, I realized that we are with their breaches, you have both a custodial sentence or a fine. But for these two specific clauses, there's only a fine. So I want to know why. And if the fine is not paid, then what's the next step? So why not a custodial sentence or sentences for these two breaches that may take place under these two clauses? Because all other breaches that I read, you have a, a, a term of imprisonment or a fine. But this is the only one where there is a fine. And the critical concern from the person breach refused to pay the fine then what's the, the recourse that we have as we move forward? So I just found that a bit strange, and I seek some clarification. Clause 36, page 52, I support the clause. Likewise, clause 37, I support them. But the question I ask, how do we prevent abuse? That's we talk about the journalism record and so on. 
and also how do we prevent abuse and the one for research that we they are exempted but we know given the advent of social media you, you just say you're doing the collecting the data for research purpose uh, for, for journalism and, and books book writing and so on but the data is exposed so how do you prevent so as a data subject you would have done a, a wrong to me so where is my redress? So while I support the intent, I just want to be clear as to how we prevent abuse. And for research purpose, how do we ensure that the ethical principles and rules in research are abided? So you collect the data for a particular purpose, but you use it for the wrong purpose, Senator Morris. How do you ensure and what is the redress there again for the particular participants? that you would have researched in this particular year. So I just want to, while I support the general intent, I would want some guidance as to how we ensure ethical principles are abide by and we don't have abuse, more so in the era of social media. Because we can't see a situation where for all fake news that becomes the order of the day and as a person gets information, they believe that um, social media must be the first means of um, um, displaying the data. So we need to ensure that while we respect journalism, research, um, book writing and so on, that data also is personal data. Right? So if you do a research with a particular group of participants, whatever they give you is given to you in good faith for the particular purpose. And even if you're going to reveal the data that ought to be known prior to. And when you collect all this data, you now have it. And you now release the data for the wrong purposes. How do we ensure that the research is taking place? Class 74 speak about regulation. And I just want to ensure, Minister, that if this bill don't have the regulation, it will be like the, 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 the um, Road Traffic Act that we pass. And we hear it as very urgent. I remember when we were debating the Road Traffic Act and we asked for some more time to, re to, to review and make our presentation, Senator Gale. We were told that given the number of road traffic accidents, this is critical and must be passed now. But I think probably two, three years later, no regulation. The Disability Act. We have four years now and since the life of the new administration. And we have yet to have that regulation. So what we're going to pass is some nice piece of provisions. But if we don't have the regulation, the bill speaks to many codes that are required to operationalize the bill. If we don't have these in place, then we can't truly move forward. And therefore, I want to know, given the importance of data protection, that if we can fast track, all are important. But in this changing, rapidly changing global world that no doubt impacts us, if we can fast track, if it means that we outsource this part of the work to some consultancy. It, no, I'm just proposing because I understand the importance of. No, I don't expect. I say outsource with the proper procurement procedures. So we have to ensure that. But I believe we all can understand the importance of the regulation because unless... That is there. What we have here are good intentions, but will not achieve the objective. We don't want three, four years to pass, Mr. President. We pass this bill, and then by the time regulation comes, it requires critical review because the digital landscape would have so changed that it, what we are protecting now would be relevant. So we have to fast track it as we move forward. I turn to page 91, which I think is the second schedule. And I just have a, a quick observation here. Page 91, 2A. And I want for, for, for consistency of the language. You see, the person shall be disqualified for appointment under subparagraph 1 if the person is a minister, parliamentary secretary, or a member of parliament. I want to propose for the avoidance of doubt, similar to what we have, I think we have it here on page 95. So we have consistency in the language where we said a member of either House of Parliament. So in one case we have 
member of parliament and on page 95 we have either house of parliament and i think both instances the intention is not to have a senator being able to be a commissioner nor to be a member of the oversight eh? no no this is the point i'm making no i want us to i'm just making a point for consistent in the language because as i said on page 91 we said our member of parliament but on page 95 we say either house of parliament so someone reading the bill mr president who would draw the conclusion that they mean two different things but i'm clear the intent is that it inquires those who sit in the lower house and those of us who are in the upper house so i'm saying for the avoidance of doubt for consistency in language either house of parliament so I'm proposing that amendment, and I hope we can take it in good faith. So we have no can, no can. Because everybody, when you talk about MP, everybody say the man who vote for. Yeah. Right, sir, right, Mr. President. <laughs> and there's a deputy. So I'm proposing that as we move forward. I turn to page 93. Page 93, number four. And it speaks to about the, the appointment of the deputy commissioner. It speaks about the commissioner may appoint an employee for the purpose of this act, and it's a one deputy commission. But Mr. President, I have a little challenge with that. And I'm going to tie it in. Given the importance of this legislation, and given the fact that the commissioner will, must be appointed in total confidence of our three primary leaders, and in this context, that deputy is absolutely essential. And a deputy will perform some of the critical private role. I want to recommend that the deputy also is appointed in accordance with the provisions for the, the commissioner. Because to, to, to have a deputy appointed in this context, given this security and the sensitivity of data, thus by the commissioner, then sometimes a higher level of accountability and the consensus and confidence that you want to see. We may, we may not have it, and I want to ensure that, because there's no regulation, so I have to ask these questions. While the terms of appointment for the commissioner is fixed, seven years, and cannot do, cannot do more than two terms, so maximum 14 years, he said that the terms and conditions for the commissioner, for, for the deputy, for example, will be left up to the, the commissioner. So could you have a... a, a, a so my questions are, will it be a fixed term contract? Can the person be reappointed? Will there be terms, terms limit to that of the commissioner? These are clearly stated for the commissioner in the bill, who will recruit the deputy, but not clearly stated for the deputy. And I also see, Mr. President, where the committee, it continues, and other staff members, and remuneration, approved by the committee. But the committee is a committee that consists of the Speaker of the House, the President, the person, the leader of government business, the leader of opposition business in both houses. Mr. President, I don't know if this is a new provision. I have not seen it. It's in relation to a number of so the public defender, I think. And the ombuds. Okay, so that's where we're taking that. That's that correct, Mr. Clark. But what I would want to see, the, the, what my, my, my concern is the, the technical support to so guide. And you establish an establishment, it's approved by the committee, but what role do we have for the public service, Ministry of Public Service? Because you might have this big intention to have 10 officers, but when you send it, send it to the Ministry of Public Service, the resources is not there. So is it that during deliberation at the at, with this special committee that the Ministry of Public Service will come in, give guidance and guidelines? So I just want some further clarification where, where, where that is concerned. Because in most bills, we have said, we have, it is in others as we have just said, but in most, it's in accordance with the procedure and guideline from the Ministry of Public Service. So I want to know what role they will play or they must play a role as we move forward. 
Also, Mr. President, page 94. Page 94, number 4. Page 94, number 4. We start speaking up, and this reinforced the point I made a while ago about the appointment of the deputy. Because the deputy commissioner shall perform the functions of the commissioner during any vacancy in that office, or at any time when the commissioner is for any reason unable to act. And it seems to be a straightforward provision. Because we are saying if you have a deputy and the, the commissioner is out, the then the deputy. But that the challenge I have, the commissioner could be out for a year or two years, due to illness, for example. And you would have a deputy now acting for that indefinite period of time, but doesn't have the confidence of the, of the leadership because he has been appointed differently from the commission. So in effect, though is the deputy, if he's acting for a year, which many things cannot mean a year, he's in effect the commissioner, the de facto commissioner. That's why I propose that if you want to have this provision here, you have to, I recommend two approaches. Either you are both appointed by the same way, the GG, Governor General, in consultation with the Prime Minister and the Leader of Opposition. So both the Commissioner and the Deputy for a fixed period of time and so on. And then the other provisions will be just for other employees. Or similar to what I see in the Public Defender Interim Act, where you are appointed for a period of say two or three months. And then it has to be reviewed. And this is where the review will come in from the oversight committee. And if there is going to be an extension, if for whatever reason the commissioner cannot return to his or her duty, then the consultation from the governor general with the two leaders ought to take place. But I, I am not comfortable with just having the deputy replacing the commissioner indefinitely. It seems to be the logical thing. But given the, the way we have structured this bill, which is very good in terms of the appointment for the commissioner, the oversight body, and the appeals tribunal, the governor general and the two leaders. But we could have a loophole here, or an escape route where the, you have a, a de facto commissioner not appointed, or not acting in accordance with the confidence level that we have. So I urge some review here. And my Recommendation will be appoint both because both will have critical roles to play and sometimes independent of each other while the deputy will still have to be accountable to the commission. But you want to have some level of security attending and some level of independence even between both offices so they can carry out their functions in accordance with the rule and protect the integrity of the system and operate to the highest level of confidence. So I, I put that there. Mr. President, I hope that we'll find some favor even for consideration as we move forward. In terms of page 96, I go to page 96. Here again, the oversight committee that I say I support, we have them appointed in for three years in the first instance, and they can be appointed only for another three years. So we have term limits for two terms. But the commissioner has a maximum period initially for seven years. So if they start both together, you could have the, the, the committee members life coming to an end before that of the commissioner. Here's the challenge I have. When you have everybody leaving the same time, you lose institutional knowledge, experience, because this is a new bill, new provisions. Person will have to learn as they go on the job. And then you have an oversight committee that everybody comes to an end. Assume that you are reappointed after three years. Everybody will automatically must vacate their position. And then you bring in an exact new team. I am proposing a staggering system. Right, so you, 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 you face in and you face out. The technical people will know how to deal with that. So for example, at the end of the first three years, you could say we, we're only going to reappoint 50% of the current board. So you're bringing some new people. So when the other three years ends, that 50% automatically must vacate, but you still have 
some to choose from for the other 50 percent time mr president the speaker's time having expired might he be might it be extended to allow him to complete his presentation you've heard the question those in favor those against the eyes have it yeah mr president so i'm proposing that because at the face of it is straightforward to say three years and another three years and you come to an end but senator gale as you know one of the challenges we have Senator Morgan, in our governance framework is that when an administration changes or a minister changes, sometimes everybody out there doing some good job, irrespective of what we think. And then all the knowledge, because it takes time to build up the knowledge. I've sit on public boards and sometimes for the first two months there I sat like a real student, learning. And as you go through, you, you, you understand the procedure, you understand the efficiencies, so you can talk with greater authority. But you understand the challenges too, that sometimes those of us who are on the outside, we criticize. But when you're in there, you understand a different play, play field, Senator Samuda. So I believe you can't have this situation and everybody leaves at once. So I propose in a staggering system and we can work out how best. So you retain institutional knowledge and you have persons that are able to give greater account of the performance of the integrity commissioner. So we have that confidence continues again as we move forward. As I wind down, Mr. President, page 97, and that has to do with the, page 97, number 5, we say they should elect a chairperson. Here again, I'm assuming for, that is for the life of the, of the committee, for the three years. I'm assuming that. It's not stated, but since it's not stated, stated I'm, I'm assuming, but I'm just asking for reinforcement. But I don't see where it speaks about electing a deputy chairperson. It speaks about if the chairman is not present, then you elect one among. But I would propose for better order. You elect a chair and a deputy. You could elect a chair for the three years and a deputy annually. And if both are not present, then you elect one among. I think it's, it, it serves a better purpose and a better order because sometimes the chair will know I'm not coming to the meeting but the deputies come in, we can share notes and so on. But if you don't know who will chair that meeting, if you are unavoidably absent, sometimes it doesn't lend itself for good governance. So I, I would recommend that we elect both a chair and a deputy, and then we know how to proceed if both are not present at the meeting. I move quickly now as I wind on to page 116. Number three. Page 116, number 3. And I don't like that provision at all. For the here, it speaks about the appeal tribunal. You elect five, me five members are appointed. Senator Gale. Yeah, at the tribunal. And for the hearing of any appeal under this act, the appeal tribunal may consist of one member sitting alone if the parties to the appeal agree. I see that. And I know nobody could say, but they have to agree. If that is the case, I don't like this provision. I think it should not be in there. I would prefer, because something are in a position that ideally Senator Morgan, you don't want to agree. And Senator Fraser, you're in the system, you know too. But sometimes for to enhance the process. But I think for justice to be to be done, we must not limit it in that context. Not just for expediency. We must ensure that if you have a five member. At least a quorum, man. Well, I would prefer to try my faith any day. Not with one person. Probably with two, but most definitely with three. And absolutely with four or five. So you can't have a tribunal of five person. And we will try with one, even if both parties agree. I think it's a wrong provision. Page 116, number three. For the hearing of any appeal on this act, the appeal tribunal may consider one member sitting alone, but there's a rider if the parties to the appeal agree. And I say that. Some man could easily ignore it and say, okay, but Senator Skeffrey, if they don't agree, it can't happen. I, I hear that. But I think we must not put that in the article. And I want to understand the rationale again, but this one man trying everything, I don't believe in that. Yeah, it happens every day, it doesn't mean that. that you see, I hear it, you know. But we, we are here, we are promoting this bill as a 
departing from some fundamental traditions or norms. But that, if it, I, I'm, I'm proposing that you delete it, but if not, no problem. You like single justice? Hope you don't like jungle justice. No, I know a different question I ask. No, it, it says it's possible. Doesn't it mean it's a culture? It is possible. Doesn't mean that it's a culture. But I'm stating my case. Yeah, man, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm saying I'm not stating my case. I understand the rider, which is a, the, the rider is a good one, you know, that you must agree. So I understand that and I stated that clearly. But irrespective of that, I don't like it because some persons, some persons from Moko might have an issue. From Cross Keys. Some persons might have an issue, Minister. And sometimes they agree. But then say, boy, if we didn't know, I'd really get some greater guidance. So I just put in that there. I rather they sit in among three and they get a decision. It's all, the majority is always a better decision for justice than one person. And, and I've, been, I've been many meetings where sometimes the chairman alone. You either get some bad decision. Yeah. Good thing you have some other strong person sometime and some boards or some committees. So I would never put my faith in one person. Even if I sign to agree, because sometimes you agree on the duress, whether directly or indirectly. And that's my concern, and I state it clearly. And if we can review it for justice, for a new bill, data protection. You know. That's the part, you know. Sometimes you might bring some issue against some data controller in some big companies. So that's seem clear. And you look a man from Flankers. No, some big, no, the data, the, 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 the data subject might have an issue with some data controllers in some big establishment. And sometimes in fear and say, boy, all right, just move on. And we indirectly rob him or her of the justice that they deserve. That's why I don't like this provision. Worse in an appeal. So I put it squarely. The final point I want to, and say page 116, number two. The, the members of the appeal tribunal, tribunal shall, subject to the provision of the schedule, hold office for a period of five years and shall be eligible for a reappointment. This is the way you know we depart from the fixed term. I just want to know why. So for the commissioner, that to be maximum two, seven years. For the oversight committee, maximum two, three years. But for the appeals committee, we are saying five years in the first instance, you can be reappointed. But I don't see where it is fixed for the two terms. So, so are we saying they can go for three term, four term, five term? And if that's the case, why the opening here and not for the other two provisions, for the commissioner and the oversight? So I think again for consistency, if that's the we want to go in terms of ensuring that people act efficiently and don't get used to a culture that they will relax the rules and regulation, then I believe the tribunal must be fixed just like the committee and the information commission. So Mr. President, those are some of the concerns I have. I hope that we can consider them and we are necessary in good faith for, for making a better bill, we can take some of them into consideration and hopefully make some amendments as we make this bill a better one. Public education, I would have to reinforce it, will be absolutely necessary. We have to take this to the people in the classroom, town hall meetings. We have seen, Mr. President, when we, when we discussed the report for the anti-gang legislation, we were said that Senator Sinclair, many provisions that the security force, for example, are asking for are already in law. It means that there's something wrong between understanding and knowing what the provisions are and what the full length of the laws are. So we have to teach. We have to teach both the citizens and the institutions that they know that both have rights and responsibilities and we do it. Also enforcement. If we're not going to have the capacity to enforce this piece of this legislation, we're going to be just another talk shop, quote unquote. Enforcement has to be critical. And it, 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 it's a very complex nature because you're going to have data in many shapes, way and form, and many institutions. But the capacity to enforce, 
will also be important as we move forward. So in closing, I support the bill. Anything to protect our people and personal data is very critical for us to protect. Security is important. And we must only at all times seek to use data for the purpose that we have collected it. And those of us who will be data controller, people will vest their faith in you and their confidence. Part of the reason why for lost work, men and women must have integrity. And when you carry out a task, and you accept a task, you must carry it out in the best interest of the society as we seek to advance the quality of society. Once again, Mr. President, we support the bill on this side. Anything that is progressive, you will always have the support of the national movement that we are on this side. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Skeffrey. Senator Morris. Don't worry, I have a very short presentation. Short presentation. And Mr. President. I'm happy to have had the opportunity to sit on the Joint Select Committee in reviewing this bill. And Mr. President, I must admit that it was indeed a challenge pouring through this lengthy bill and committing to process all the technical matter. And at this point, I must commend the technical team for the awesome work that they have done in getting us to this stage. Indeed. They were extremely patient, extremely accommodating. All our queries, believe me, I am layman, and I now believe that I know this bill cover to cover. Thank you so much for the hard work. Uh, Mr. President, it's interesting that years ago, the school where I, 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 I was serving at that time, they requested that our fingerprint information for <coughs> signing in purposes and I, we never stopped to question that this information could have been used in another way. We never questioned who would have been protecting that information. We just gave it. And so, Senator Skeffrey, I share your call right, in asking that the public, especially those who may be vulnerable, that little old lady, that person who is not fully abreast with the technology, we have to ensure that we unpack this legislation for them to understand, appreciate, even as they reap the full benefits thereof. Mr. President, it should be understood that the bill before us is also a major security feature for our people as we embrace the modern digital era. This bill, in my mind, serves to protect our rights and our identity. One of the realities that COVID-19 has forced us to embrace is that digital platforms, for example, is the future and that we have to get with it. Now, in light of this reality that we need to get with it, Mr. President, we have to value this piece of legislation that serves to safeguard our rights, our identity, as we engage in this new virtual reality. How data is used, stored, and secure and protected are monumental concerns of this age. Last night I had a chat with Dr. Um, Sof Senator Sophia Longmore, and she was very insistent on the fact that it must be fully understood that this is a monumental piece of legislation that we are taking here. And we commend Minister Favor Williams and her team for the hard work that has gone into this. <laughs> Mr. President, at primary school, I think you know teachers have spent teachers spend a lot of time with who am I, 
who am I in terms of you know, our identity. It's a major part of our development. I hope we can appreciate the fact that today the definition of who am I, it comes within the context of the new digital reality. Maybe not so new, right, especially for other territories, but it's new for many of us as Jamaicans who were not quite yet on board. This bill demands that the public, in light of the world that we live in, will be able to identify who they are as individuals. In this way, they will be able to appreciate why it is increasingly important to have their data protected and to grasp the objectives of this bill, one of which is to safeguard important information from corruption, from compromise, or from loss information about yourself, information, things about ourselves that we took for granted and that we are, many of us, taking for granted is extremely important. And Senator Morrison, Mor Morgan, you last week you effectively navigated how our da data is important and how companies make big bucks from the who am I, who we are as individuals. Tremendous pr presentation. We called it the Nesta Clause, and Senator um, Matthew Samuda, right? Whenever we're attending committee, we would meet each other at the door and we say, Nesta talk about in clause yet? <laughs> so, you know, that would give some kind of marker as to how early we would get out. But coming out of your presentation, um, Senator Morgan, we can appreciate why there are some individuals who are not so savvy with the technology. They complain that from me go Google this, my phone just back up with pure advertisement. Me no know where them EPA suck me a come from and just pack up my phone. So having a handbook where Ordinary Jamaican citizens can understand what this whole move is about is going to prove to be very useful. The bill defines what is considered as personal data. The bill also takes into consideration non-disclosure provisions. Very often we hear people say, no worry, me can't get him file. No worry, me have a link down at the office there. We have a link at a lawyer office, that doctor office, right around a tax place, where me can just get somebody to break into a system and give me the information and give me the whole file on that person. In light of that, of, of that reality, uh, Mr. President, we can appreciate that this bill and the thrust towards data protection is also about securing our privacy against unauthorized access. Mr. President, it can't be that people are able to gather our personal information and just use it without permission. I am liking part two of the bill, which speaks to the rights of the data controller. Attention is paid to clauses six and seven. Also clause 11, I think Senator Skeffrey spoke about it, which speaks about the right to prevent processing. Part four of the bill, and I call our attention to clauses nine, 10, and 11, speaks about the duty of the data controller to comply with standards. So this is not a case Mr. President, where the data can controller can do as they feel like with your data. There are certain rules that are in place, certain restrictions that are in place, and certain prohibit sanctions that will, be, that will serve to be prohibitive. Part five, Mr. President, speaks about information available to the public by order or enactment and disclosures required by law in connection with legal proceedings. Therefore, Mr. President, the bill is very clear about privacy and that privacy is paramount to this bill. Mr. President, part four, I, 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 this is one of my favorite parts of the bill, because it speaks about on what will, um, the consequences of unlawfully obtaining 
disclosing personal data and the prohibition of requirements as to pro the production of certain records, avoidance of certain contractual terms relating to health records. Mr. President, that the bill will be reviewed, there's a review period for the bill, is extremely beneficial, extremely useful. So it means that where there are instances where we can correct for it to be more efficient, such it is allowed for in the bill. We may differ, Senator um, Gale, as to the time, if it should be five years or three years. But all in all, Mr. President, this piece of legislation, it serves to protect us. It serves to protect people like Senator Charles Sinclair, who admitted that to this day, he is yet to use an ATM. <laughs> He's <laughs> because he is protecting himself. Senator Sinclair actually goes to the bank, Senator Morgan, and he joins the line. In this day and age, he admits being paranoid about protecting, about protecting his privacy and protecting. You were there, Senator. Huh? You, you've gone past. Right? And we hope. So, Senator Sinclair, we hope that you can take comfort in this piece of legislation where your information will be protected. Forget online. He's not ready for that yet. Yes. <laughs> but, Mr. President, in closing, I will say that we are taking a step in the right direction. And this even further prepares us for the NIDS bill. Mr. President, there is no turning back. Jamaica has to embrace this new world. Jamaica has to get on board. But in doing so, we are ensuring that by way of legislative authority, we are in a position to protect ourselves. May it so please you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator Morris. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I rise to make a brief intervention in this debate. <laughs> um, Mr. President, when Minister opened the presentation. She described the situation as our um, data as the new gold. And uh, Senator Fraser Bins described the situation as the new platinum. But wherever you take it, Mr. President, it is an extremely important piece of legislation. I'm making the contribution, Mr. President, amidst a little challenge that I had in terms of my uh, bill. But I discussed that with the clerk, and we'll have that sorted out. But the issue at hand, Mr. President, I have two concerns that I want to raise. One I want is a clarification, and uh, the other is an issue that I want to bring to the attention of the policymakers and in particular, Ministers Samuda and Johnson Smith, since they are in cabinet, so that they are cognizant of the situation. The first has to do, Mr. President, with the 
Disabilities Act makes provision for the um, establishment of database um, for uh, registration of persons with disabilities. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is that in today's environment, there's a lot of focus on persons with disabilities in terms of research because people are trying to get a greater understanding of the population of persons with disabilities and so you know um, there is that curiosity in terms of researchers and so wherever there is any concentration of data on the population of persons with disabilities researchers tend to gravitate to the, those uh, those entities so i want to find out uh, mr president if in the context of uh, this legislation that uh, individuals conducting research considerations are given to them uh, executing their work and if it is that they are, um, are going to gain access to uh, the, the, the private the, um, data what are the protective mechanisms that are there. I'm just seeking some clarity on it because of the challenges that I had in terms of um, going through the bill. So I just want to find out, Minister, if you could explain in that particular situation what are the protective mechanisms that are there to ensure that the private personal data of persons with disabilities who are registered in the database at an institution like the Jamaica Society for the, uh, the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities would be uh, protected um, from, in terms of the research being conducted. And the, 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 the other point that I want to make and to bring to the attention of uh, the ministers so that they can deal with it from the standpoint of uh, the cabinet because it is posing a real challenge in the academic community and I know it is posing a real challenge for the government as well because when you have access to credible data it contributes to effective planning and if you don't have credible data, what you would be doing is basically grouping in the dark in terms of policy formulation. And I say that to bring to the attention that there is no sense of accurate data on the population of persons with disabilities in Jamaica. When you check with statin and ask them what's the population of persons with disabilities in the country, they are saying, uh, and the last figure that I, I heard, Minister, was 70,000 individuals. Now, that is absolutely ridiculous because in 1991 the census showed at the time that there was about a hundred and just a little bit below 170,000 persons having a disability in 2001 it showed just over 2001 so how is it that in 20, 
how is it that in 2020 the figure is showing uh, 70,000? It means that something would have radically gone, uh, taken place between uh, 2001 and 2011 because 2011 is when the uh, last census took place. And so there is a need for a specific census to be done or to make sure that in the next round of census that there is there are some specific and accurate questions that are uh, put in place to capture the data on uh, persons with disabilities in the country because it is needed in order to make effective planning. If it is that there is, uh, take for example, we are in the COVID environment now. And I am certain that if the government had accurate data on the population of persons with disabilities, Senator Morgan, it would make for much more effective planning because you could map, you could know where these individuals are and how you could target your, your, your policy intervention or your program intervention for these individuals. And so definitely we, we, we want to see uh, either in the next round of census some specific questions that are um, designed. I mean, I know that they are the questions, you know, but I there's a cluster of questions that um, have to be formulated to capture the data on persons with disabilities and not necessarily the what they are going to tell me. Yes, we have the international classification of functioning questions uh, coming out of the Washington uh, consensus um, grouping. Not because it has to be tailor-made to Jamaican reality so that we get an accurate picture of the population. Uh, or if it is that is not going to happen, we have to do a specific census to capture the population of persons with disabilities in the country because we need it in order to get the accurate data. I, I, I know that when statin captures the data, that it is protected because they are not going to give away um, personal information on individuals based on my experience with them. But it is the interpretation and availability of the uh, data on the population that I have a fundamental concern about. My, Mr. President, Senator Skeffrey, in his presentation, spoke to the importance of a public education drive for this uh, piece of legislation. And it is extremely important that this be done because as Senator Morrison said in our presentation, we have a culture in this country where, you know, um, may have a little link over that particular office, may have a little linky down at the tax office, or may have a little bestie down at the um, health center who can give me the data. And in that process, people's private personal data is made available to in the all and sundry. This legislation frowns upon that behavior. And this legislation is saying to all and sundry who is engaged in that practice, 
dying calm foolishness done people's personal data belongs to them and must be protected and I believe that there has the Dolly House smash up the Dolly House smash up so, so, so what has to happen now is that we have to engage in a consistent public education program where this is concerned and I, I, I tell you Senator Morgan we in Jamaica we are accustomed to doing three months public education programs the best I think I, I have read and seen in Jamaica and studied in terms of case study is the two is better than too many campaign in the 80s and it was very effective but we need to have something similar that is sustainable because when you are going to change a culture you know the culture can't change in a two to three month period it has to change over time it is going to change over time and so you have to be consistent with your public education program and so i strongly support the call from senator uh, skeffrey where that is concerned so mr president with the two issues that i raised minister i I um, hope that you can give some clarity and guidance on, on those issues and to make sure that in your sittings in cabinet that, that issue, those issues be highlighted where the uh, uh, establishment of a special mechanism to capture data on the population of persons with disabilities are concerned and also to uh, support the call for a public education program. May it please you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator Morris, sorry. Thank you. Senator. Fire. Don't worry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know my colleagues and members of staff, technical persons, are here extensively today. Um, I won't be too long. I just wanted to raise one or two key issues with this Data Protection Act. We have all recognized the very significant piece of legislation this is, and I would like to just add my voice to that recognition. Um, as we see to Jamaica keeping in accordance with somewhat requirements, but keeping up with the first world nations in terms of the EU model for data protection and recognizing that this is somewhat the technological process as humanity evolves. Um, but whilst we recognize that this is virtually a right, pun on virtually, <laughs> um, the fact is that there could be also significant opportunities that we may develop and enhance. I think our recent experience with the COVID and the fact that we had to restrict our movements and limit our social interactions brought to light the very significant um, efforts that can be made to develop industries and the pos potential possibilities that exist in that realm. And so this Data Protection Act also seeks, I hope, to enable the secured benefit of the development of such industries. Um, recognize that entertainment, a field that Jamaica significantly could profit from, but also could develop in this virtual space, is one that is wide open. And as we contemplate all sorts of economic um, turmoil from this COVID situation, let us not be blind to the opportunities that especially this piece of legislation could bring in developing such industries. 
I particularly have and paid attention to the issues that relate to health. And uh, I, like I said, I won't be too long. But Senator Morgan, you mentioned something that I took um, particular attention to in terms of the potential and the difference in the psychological impact that someone could have having their data um, manipulated without their permission. And there is significant um, protection, I notice, in, in Clause 69 regarding the individual's subjective measure and the distress that it may cause. And I'm very glad to see that that level of awareness was paid to the, to the, to the potential of, of such abuse and that there is protection within the legislation for such matters. I also made attention to Clause 23D which provides for the conditions of the processing of personal data in accordance with the first standard where provisions are made to see to the use of personal data, including medical records. Um, I think Senator Skeffrey, you mentioned um, something around this, and which seeks to protect the, well, the use of the medical records in where it might be necessary to protect the vital interests of the data subject, and 24C2 goes further to see to the vital interests of another individual. And further on, in 35, the public safety. Um, I think, again, with respect to the COVID, the recent COVID experience, I think this brings very, very pertinent comfort to the fact that we are not going to just, it is not a, a piece of legislation that is going to allow for the random use of information without the due um, basis for that use. But I also want to recognize that there is an adjoining clause in 35B that sees to the protection from the maladministration of this um, information by public authorities. I also, in this respect, want to bring attention to the fact that this piece of legislation could be greatly used to enhance the delivery of our healthcare services. It is the wave of the future in terms of preventative healthcare delivery and personal healthcare delivery and how this piece of data could, this piece of legislation could be used to enable the very direct delivery of health risk to an individual based on their lifestyle choices, et cetera, but also to keep tabs of persons who need to be seen, who need to be followed up, who need to be checked on. The role of, uh, we see where the Minister of Health is trying to increase the role and, and the cadre of community health aides who are directly interacting in the community with citizens. And this legislation could be very useful for them in knowing which diabetic is, did not go and get their blood pressure, their, their, their blood sugar checked in the past six months, which hypertensive is in need of a restock of their supplies, which older person may need to go get this and that investigation, which person has a high family risk of this cancer, etc., etc. So the direction in terms of healthcare delivery that this piece of legislation um, uses, could, could be used is, is quite significant, and I am hopeful for such. Um, I just want to lastly, because like I said, many of the topics that I had uh, have been referred to already, so I'm, I'm going to be brief. My very last um, point that I wanted to, to join in is the call for the public education. But I would want to particularly emphasize the need amongst our elderly population. The persons who an email address is still unknown to them. The persons who have no idea what you mean when you say www. Um, this piece of legislation, <laughs> this, exact, this piece of legislation significantly could impact the service delivery that they could receive and the benefits they could have. But if they have no understanding as to how it operates and how it works and how to access it, they could greatly be left behind. And so I think that there needs to be a significant effort 
and a continued effort to enable especially the elderly group in our population to understand the ramifications of this piece of legislation and also how to possibly benefit from it. Mr. President, I thank you and um, those are my brief comments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Longmore, and may I welcome. It seems like it's going to be a short presentation from Senator Brown. Look, sir, I, I expect that to be. Mr. President, this bill that is before us and for which such glowing comments have been made have been with us, certainly with the Parliament, since 2017. It was the Data Protection Act of 2017. It got to Giant Select Committee probably in 2018. And, and there was a lot of cry, especially from the opposition, for this to come forward. Not only when we debated the needs did we say this was an important piece of legislation, but there was delay. That delay means that we have wasted three years. Three years in protecting the rights of the citizens. So, I can understand the is to move it through today. But let us not forget that we were tardy and too tardy. And I say this against the background, Mr. President, that the European Union had from the early part of this, from the first decade of 2000, had moved legislation that had impact the world and impact us. So we're trailing behind others who have paved the way for the protection of citizens. In this respect, Mr. President, there are lessons that we can learn from them. One of the areas that is of concern to me, and I appreciate the presentation of Senator Gale as it relates to workers, is that consent can be given for the use of the data. But the issue is at what point can that consent be effective? What is there? for someone collecting data, be it the employer, be it a customer, a sales a vendor, saying at the point of that contract, the employment contract, for example, to sign within that employment contract that I agree that my data may be provided to others. And the only way you get the job is if you sign that. So all the protection we give them, the economic necessity of survival could mean that we sign away our right just to get the job. Because unemployment not nice. So I do hope, Minister, just as Mr. Shearer argued Senator Gill, I want Senator Gill's attention. Just as Mr. Shearer argued in 74, when the Employment Termination Redundancy Payment Act was being drafted, that you can't sign your right out of a contract at the time, out of the right to notice out of a contract, at the time when you're getting the job. Because as Mr. Shearer said then, any lawyer, sorry, Donna, any lawyer could advise an employer, just put in a clause 
which they had signed a right to notice. And they found a way in that centagram to say, at the time of dismissal, that's when the waiver must take place. You can't waive your right to notice until the time of dismissal. So you can't trick the worker by saying, you get this job on the basis that you sign away your right to notice. So I hope that the technical people and the minister would consider that. How do we protect workers? At what point can I consent? At a point when I am weak, when I need the service or the job, and I hope we can look at that. If we are serious about protecting that such a consent can only be given within weeks or days of the disclosure of any data. It's important that we get that. So I go to a bank and the bank is superior. I need somewhere to put the money under my that is under my mattress. And the bank says, I can only take it if you allow me to disclose your data. I can sign it away. I can sign, I can consent. So my point is, my point is, if I can consent, and it's about 7-2, seven, seven at page. So if I can consent, it must be at what point? At what point must that consent take place? I think that's important that we put that in the legislation so we don't leave it in general that you can consent. Because you can consent. We must close that door that the consent must be when I am strong, not when as a customer or an employee I am weakest. And I therefore urge consideration for that. It's not a matter we need to quarrel about. It's about whether we protect the people in the way we want. Because there's so many some the exemptions in the bill that frightens me, and especially those of national security because those can be abused too. So in praising the bill, we must recognize that there are some deficiencies in it. Second point I want to make here, Mr. President, in the debate, in the debate a lot was said about the value of the Giant Select Committee. And having sat on a number of Giant Select Committees, I can attest to the value of those committees. They are less partisan. They are less partisan. And they allow members from both sides sitting usually together on the same side to fashion solutions to national problems. Now, sadly, Mr. President, that doesn't get the media attention because that is, that is dog-biting man in parliamentary terms. But if we quarrel and disagree, that makes the news because that's man-biting dog in the sense of journalism. But the Giant Select Committee approach has been very good. Sometimes it takes some time, but the, the proper leadership can get us. I've seen the anti-gang legislation, the benefit from the Giant Select Committee. The Bank of Jamaica, on which some of us in here sit, has benefited from that cross-fertilization of ideas. And so, I urge us as senators not just to recognize today the value of the giant slave committees, but to appreciate 
that when a couple of years ago we on this side called for a joint select committee approach to the needs bill and that was rejected and that is part of the reason why we do not have a needs bill today and let me make it clear we on this side long ago called for a national identification system we support a national identification system we support a national identification system one that starts with the voluntary apply application And so we, are, not, we were never opposed to needs. In fact, Mr. President, I am reliably informed that in the court case, Julian Robinson versus the AG, in that case, the government side through the AG argued that the points raised by the opposition in the Senate has caused the bill to be a better bill and therefore not unconstitutional. Well, because they didn't accept all the points we were making, and to show that it was unconstitutional, the, why we were saying these points should be made, which would have been made in a giant select committee if we had won, the bill was thrown out. In recent time, Mr. President, we have heard, especially with COVID, that if we had needs, we could solve a lot of the COVID problems. Well, the reality is, until this Data Protection Act is in place, needs have no place. So it is disingenuous for anybody in the middle of COVID and people suffering to be saying needs is the answer, as if needs could come by the wave of a wand. Which is why, again, I say this Data Protection Act was a 2017 Act. We're three years behind. And we've been many years behind with needs because, as Senator Scott Martley pointed out, there's no provision in this budget, in this supplementary budget either, for bringing this Act fully into being. So there's going to be another delay. And Senator Skeffer pointed out the road traffic act and the delay that has followed that. So I'm not going to about this protection because this act will be passed but sit on some desks, gathering dust because of lack of resources to fix the office of the Commission of Information and the necessary staffing. So we'll applaud third reading. We'll knock the desk in celebration of third reading of this bill, but about bringing it into being is what is important. Not just the passage, not you or the other president <laughs> signing it, and then the Governor General assenting. The critical thing is when do we get this operationalized so that the people, as in the European Union, can really benefit from it? Yes, this is a first start, passing it. We have to go beyond passing it, we have to commit to a time frame to having it implemented, to have it work, and for the pu public education that Senator Skeffer and others have spoken about, to take effect. And that seems to me to be some time down the road. The other point I want to make, Mr. President, is that this bill is going to require a lot of trust and confidence. Point I make about consent, when do you consent? 
I've seen too many people in the society operate in an unethical way. And so this protection will need trust. It makes no sense an employer or a business person say, well, what's the consequence of breaking it? Who is going to really prosecute me? And they will do this, Mr. President, because they will say, we have seen the government lacking in trust. So we, the citizens, business people or otherwise, local or foreign, can do wise, likewise. When I think, Mr. President, that in this Senate, questions are asked, questions are routed through the cabinet office, answers are given, recorded on video, recorded and answered, written answers provided, and then ministers of government and prime minister can get up and say, it wasn't so, and give you a different version from what was given here. What that tells me is there's a lacking of trust. And if the citizens of the country, business people are otherwise, business people are, I don't care if you think we're doing good. That's a problem sometimes, we're too good. Truth is what I want to come out. So, Mr. President, if the example set by government is to not speak the truth, not speak the truth, then business people, people who gather the data, will say, we can do likewise. They will say, we didn't reject your data. We weren't the ones who rejected your data. And so I want to know. I don't know who you think don't believe me. Because, Mr. President, trust is critical. And this government, in recent time, has demonstrated to the country that you can't trust them. I won't use the word, the three-letter word, but I've seen even from the Prime Minister and Minister who sits here some amount of mendacity. That's not a good example when you're dealing with a bill like this. In fact, the prison deal was rejected right in here. May I, may I please you, Mr. President? Mr. President, if you could just, um, if we could crave your indulgence for five minutes. I don't know if you want to call for a suspension for five minutes to allow me to um, get some instructions from the technical team. The question we is that we suspend for 10 minutes. Um, Thank you. Uh, for five minutes um, and resume right afterwards. Those in favor? Eyes have it. No, there was no one. Hello. Hi, Grandma. I miss you. Can you come and visit me? I miss you too, darling. But you know, this coronavirus can cause serious problems to older people like me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have to stay at home to protect myself and you too. Okay, Grandma. Stay safe and remember <laughs> to wash your hands. All the time. Bye, darling. If you have a cough, sneeze, sniffle, fever, flu-like symptoms, or any respiratory illness, by order under the Disaster Risk Management Act, stay at home.
my connection to the 